so they're limiting how many people and they have to wear face masks and all that stuff but right. um you know for for a few months they were not able to go into the lab so they're feeling like the students are really happy to to be able to get out of their apartment and go to the lab Good. yeah how about you yeah they're, they're motivated right so they are motivated they're, yeah. they're eager to get back to to the lab yep yeah a little uh, bit i of think arizona is uh, is on uh all open so my my student who's working on experiment back to the lab already i see so there's no are they having to wear face masks or uh yes there's a requirement and uh, i think uh, uh half my group working on experiment they are all uh in the lab they wear masks uh, I see. You know, how about at Harvard? Is is Harvard sort of reopened? Yes. Are we open for two weeks? No. And and how are they going to handle undergrads coming back in the fall? I think that's like a little bit of a controversial thing, at least here. Yeah, I I don't know anything de definitive. So all kinds of the things we're talking about uh, being talked about. Yeah. yeah. For here, they're talking about having the students come back, but then there's controversy about whether you teach in person or online. And if you're just teaching online, then are we really giving the students the value that they're paying for? And um, that's difficult. And some of the faculty are older and don't want to be exposed to the possibility of you know getting the virus. So it's yeah. a bad, bad situation. I don't really know the right solution. Yeah. But you said you have young children. Yeah, nine, nine and 11. So not, not too young, but younger than yours, I guess. <laughs> so um, how, how do they feel for not seeing their friends or spend a lot of time with their parents? <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> oh, that's the best part for you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> for me, yeah, right. Um, uh, they, you know, they, they miss their friends. We have a few people in our neighborhood that um, we've kind of, um, the kids interact with. And so we kind of consider them as like an extended family. Uh -huh. So they do have a few friends that they can play with. Um, but um, but I, I don't know, they've been using different apps and stuff to communicate with their friends. Uh -huh. so they're not quite old enough to have cell phones, but they have tablets where they can use uh, these like messenger apps and they can do video and kind of like zoom um so i think that's probably helped a little bit i know it's helped with my parents because they're um they're staying at home and, and not going out so they've really been enjoying um, like zoom meetings and stuff like that so it helps but it's not ideal mm -hmm. yeah hi hey michael hey i'm Chin and you go hey, morning. morning good morning oh. thank you for all your help Problem. Thank you for yeah. offering this uh, webinar. Yeah, looking forward to it. And yeah, we were just talking about how the uh, the virus is sort of affecting plans for the fall for undergrads coming back to campus. I was just curious how uh, everyone's respective university was handling it. Hey, Michael, how did you get started uh, with uh, liquid metals? I honestly don't don't know. How did you guys use yeah, it's, it's, when you were in the uh, white side school? Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, yeah, my, my PhD is actually on polymer. So <laughs> I'm kind of a, a confused soul. Um, <laughs> yeah, when I was in the white sides group, there were people that were interested in measuring charge transport through self-assembled monolayers. Yeah. So basically you take a, a film of gold deposit the a, a, you know monolayer of, of organic molecules but then you need a second electrode to kind of like put on top and people had mostly been using mercury which has a bunch of problems including you know toxicity and there was a bunch it was shorting and not really working so well and um there was a, a guy named ryan kicky who's one of my good friends um who's a chemist and he realized oh there's there's actually alternatives to mercury and uh, so they started using this technique of, of using uh, the liquid metal. And they noticed something interesting, which is when you bring a drop of the metal down to the surface and on a, on a syringe needle and kind of pull up, it would break as a cone. So it was holding its shape when usually liquids should, of course, form hemispheres or spherical structures. 
<clears throat> so that's kind of when I got involved and it was looking at trying to figure out, well, why is that? Is there some, you know, indium enriching at the interface or is it something else? And we quickly learned it was the oxide shell that forms and um, started doing a little bit of rheology. And honestly, at that point, it was um, it was exciting and nobody had really thought about it or very few people. And um, I always called it kind of a solution looking for a problem. And um, it's got so many unique pro properties that we just um, really for my, my young career, um, we just keep finding different applications that take advantage of all the properties. Yeah, I remember reading the paper very early on you, when you guys just published. I forgot why I did read that. You guys do this um, uh, rheology measurement. Yeah. yeah. And it was a debating what you are seeing is a, is a cracking, a plasticity or surface tension or something like that. So all these words are so dear to me. Um, I know, and I'm a little nervous about today because I know like words that I say very casually and don't have a real, you know, strong basis in technical meaning. <laughs> I know that in the mechanics community they do. So please excuse me if I uh, misspeak, but yeah, that, that's actually kind of a question um, that I've had as well, because we always call like the breaking of the oxide a yield stress, but, um, and in some ways it is because unlike other materials, it breaks and reforms. And so, you know, you're, you're, you're breaking it like, fr like I would say almost like fracturing it like you would with glass, but, but then it reforms. And so if you keep pulling, it, it's like you're breaking, 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 breaking. And so that way it's almost like a, like a plastic deformation. Yeah, but uh, so actually we had a question at that point. Now I can ask you. Um, so it's oxide. Let's say it's a normal oxide like ceramic. We don't know. Maybe you know better now. Uh, so the growing part is mainly growing new oxide. It's not like uh, two pieces of this oxide can can heal and deform. It's not like that, right? Right. So I think what happens is you you know you pull on it and it yeah. breaks, and then the underlying metal gets exposed and it forms new oxide. Um, I'm not going to show this today, but we've kind of looked at how fast the oxide forms and, you know, the, that initial oxide layer that forms, um, it's thought to occur in like microseconds. So it's, it forms really fast, but it doesn't reach the steady state thickness, um, for like maybe an hour. I don't remember the exact numbers, but not right away. Yeah. So it, it seems to me very likely, like if you have sort of, I would call mature oxide and you pull on it then you've got two like thicker solids that are connected together by a thinner solid. So if you continue to pull, it's gonna to continue to break where it's weakest, which would be where it's thinnest. That's sort of the logic. I mean, it's difficult to study because if you do it in air, it's, you can't really see it other than the surface, you know, looks wrinkled or whatever, but um, it would be interesting to do it maybe like in a SEM where you could control the oxygen concentration and actually measure the mechanical properties. So uh, I guess Turn is here as well. He is, uh, he is, uh, he also did a lot of work on sim film fracture and uh, Buckley. Yeah, so actually I, I, I meant to ask you, um, hmm. how sensitive is the uh, liquid metal on the strain rate? This might be a naive question because I'm less familiar with liquid metal. Yeah, so depending, yeah, how fast or how slowly you deform the material, are they behave quite differently or? Um, no, so uh, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but we did uh, frequency sweeps um, while doing rheology. And the idea was to try to kind of like probe different time scales and we didn't see a major difference. Um, you know, the experiments are a little tricky to do because you need to, uh, it's ideally you would like just a nice flat film with no wrinkles, right? But anytime you touch the metal, you deform it. And so mm -hmm. even just loading the sample into the rheometer, you're gonna get some um, anisotropy in terms of like wrinkles and, and roughness. Um, 
so I would just say like there's some experimental challenges, but anyway, when we did the experiment with in you know rheological setting, we didn't see anything over the range of frequencies. Sorry, we didn't see any differences between the behavior of a range of frequencies that we tested. Um, I would think that maybe if you went to high enough frequencies, you could start seeing the effects of the oxide forming. Um, but I don't know, that would be, I mean, if it's forming on microseconds, I guess that would be like um, a million hertz or something. So th this sounds uh, uh, to some extent very similar or in certain ways similar to like uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, if you are charging and discharging the uh, batteries, right? In the electrode materials, um, when you uh, charge the material, the battery, the anode, they have the, uh, the ions inserted into the anode material or, um, and then uh, it deform significantly. And uh, so the material, anode material, the deformation behavior is very different from the pure material itself. Uh, because the material itself is actually, the composition is different. Mm -hmm. as you as it deforms uh, in your case it seems that the oxidation is uh, always uh, occurring uh, when you have new surface exposed to the surface so then the so-called the deformation behavior you observe or you measure is actually not as a pure material just like uh, in the electrode material in batteries so when we people talk about the significant plastic deformation of the battery electrode during charging, uh, uh, part of that because of the deformation, part of that is results from the composition change as well. Yeah, it's, it's interesting you mentioned that, and I don't know how far I can draw an analogy, but the kind of the second half of my talk, I'll talk about um, electrochemistry, where we intentionally oxidize the metal, and we see enormous changes in interfacial tension which suggests that we can actually control the kind of the stress of the oxide um, using electrochemistry. So there's some analogy, I think, with, with batteries um, through like ion insertion or, or whatever the mechanism may be. Um, so anyway, I hope that you like that and, and maybe we can discuss more after you see it. But uh, basically we're, we're able to make the interfacial tension of the metal go close to zero, which is pretty crazy. Hey, Michael, this is Jamisha. Uh, hey, Jimmy. Hi, Michael. How are you? Good. Thank you for being here. Thank it you. Must... Thank you. I see the map behind you is made of uh, liquid metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should. <laughs> oh, I see. OK. Yeah. Uh, Actually, you see, I also have a map in my back. <laughs> see, this is something uh, interesting, because nowadays I spend quite some time working on cellulose materials. This is a real map, okay? It's not a virtual <laughs> background. Map. So it, it's a real map here. I, I, I'm somewhere here. <laughs> and I think Jigan is somewhere here. And Han Ching is here. Yeah. Uh, Michael, you are somewhere here. And That's right. Phoebe, yeah. you are somewhere. In the middle of the see. ocean. <laughs> yeah, somewhere <laughs> here. <laughs> good, good. Yeah. That's, interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. But I like uh, Michael's map. Actually, it's quite quite fascinating. I had a, a student, actually as an undergrad that worked in my lab and I'm hoping that he'll join the call, but he was amazing. Um, worked in my lab for several years, but he was kind of conflicted. He, was, he loved science and engineering, but he also loved art. And I tried very hard to get him to uh, push him into going to engineering, uh, but he ended up going to Savannah Art School, which is a really great art program. So this was like kind of a combination of his two skill sets, um, doing art and also interest in, interest in science. Yeah, but, but if you uh, read it more carefully, Michael, your map has the uh, Atlantic Ocean in the middle. Uh, whereas <laughs> Tung's map is different. <laughs> the Pacific Ocean is in the middle. <laughs> I actually just recently learned that, you know, the way that different cultures center the map is like kind of reflective of wherever your own country is, which kind of blew my mind because I'd only seen one map yeah. my whole life based on where I've lived. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Interesting. So how large, what's the length scale of your, the map printed uh, uh, over there? I think the whole thing was 
you know, about the size of a piece of paper, something like that. Uh, so yeah, this is just digital. Uh, I used to actually, oh, you know what? I still have it. I'll see the real thing. Yeah, it doesn't look as pretty as that. That one's kind of false colored. Uh, you can't see oh, it because of the- get it. Uh, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, we can see I see. It. Okay. <laughs> mm, Jimmy, uh, do you want to show a slide and uh, talk briefly about EML? Do you want to? Sure. Please. Okay. We can do this uh, at uh, ten o'clock when people are. Uh, that would be good. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, Michael, uh, the time is uh, not so so critical. We normally uh, start on time, 10 o'clock. And uh, so the end time is a normal time is 11 o'clock. But if you finish early, a few minutes later, few minutes, doesn't matter okay. too much. Okay. The, yeah, many people, um, vast majority of people will watch video. That's yep. what I think. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, will, I always say nobody's ever complained about a short talk, but I'll, I'll try to be right on an hour or so. <laughs> um, I've had a few slides at the end. I, I see John just joined us. John is here, yeah. Oh, great John. Yeah. Oh, yeah right. I was list I've been listening for a while. I was on the wrong <laughs> link, though. So I was uh, Suleen is here, too. Suleen is also here. Morning, yeah. John. Morning, Suleen. Yeah, yeah. Hey, so, so Michael, you're now surrounded by EML team. Yeah. I don't recall you submit <laughs> any paper to EML. Is that a fact? I have. I have one. Oh. I have one paper, and I guess I should have more now that I'm surrounded. <laughs> Crush the bond. Yeah. Put my hands on. <laughs> yeah, we had one paper, and it was actually highlighted in CNE News. I remember. I remember. I remember, oh, I remember. Yes. John was teasing me about it to have a mechanics paper in a chemistry uh, periodical. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. It actually, we, we actually, I posted something at Mechanica because uh, John told us that's a big deal uh, to be highlighted yeah. in CN and uh, yeah. Well, the uh, reporter, very wide, uh, readership. Yeah. The reporter called me and I was trying to kind of paint paint our work in broad strokes so they'd have some perspective. Um, they were doing a story on liquid metal. And they said, well, do you have any like really recent work? I was like, well, yeah, just publish this paper in email and they, they ran with it. <laughs> so um, I didn't, didn't push it, but that, that's what they latched onto. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the way, how did you go to our, uh, you, you had this tech talk. Uh, uh, the, the TED talk? Uh, this, what, what do you call it? Uh, was it TED talk or talk? something? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that was uh, just by invitation. There was a a local school actually in Durham, which is about thirty minutes from here, and they I think you have to apply to host a, a TED workshop or whatever they call it. And uh, I don't think I realized that it was a big deal at the time. But <laughs> they invited me. Oh, and that's uh, is that the TEDx. Yeah, TEDx. So it's like the the baby TEDx. TEDx. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they yeah they invited me and three other speakers, and uh, I was joking, and I guess this talk is maybe similar, but I was joking that 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 talk might be the only thing my grandchildren know about me. <laughs> so <laughs> I uh, I actually you know prepared as best I could, and I thought the talk went really well, but then the two or three speakers that were after me were just knocked it out of the park and. <laughs> uh, really, them less about myself. <laughs> so it was a really great experience, and. Um, yeah, I mean that video. I think it's gotten thirty thousand or so hits. So it's um, oh, well, amazing. You no, know, I'm usually happy if like twenty or thirty people cite my papers, and it's <laughs> kind of you know multiply that by a thousand. It's kind of hard to gauge the impact, but you kind of mm -hmm. hope that there's some young people out there that are seeing those videos and might want to go into science as a result of it. Yeah. By the way, uh, I don't know, Michael. You know this. Maybe Jigong has already told you this. Uh, for the speaker, for each of the uh, EML webinar speakers, uh, we would invite, for example, in this case, you to write uh, a, an overview of your talk. Uh, yeah, I actually worked on that yesterday. So, yeah, I've got a pretty good jump start on that and we'll submit it whenever you guys tell me to. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much.
It's about three pages, sound about right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. However long you want. Okay. All right, perfect, yeah. Yeah, I worked on that yesterday. I thought it would kind of help me clarify my thoughts for today. <laughs> Hopefully it works. Good. So there is uh, this issue, or uh, there's a John, uh, John Rogers uh, uh, relate our experience with the Gordon Conference. Uh, there's a very important difference. Gordon Conference does not allow you to take videos, but we do. This is for practical reasons right? all over the world. So then there is an issue whether how much people are willing to talk about unpublished work if it's a video recorded. So we thought uh, if um, you also write an overview, publish a paper, whatever you feel is sensitive, that's considered a publication. Mm -hmm. Right, immediate. Yeah. Yeah. The publication from day of your submission to uh, the thing goes online within a week, so far our experience. Elsevier really makes it uh, works so smoothly. Nice. So, so I guess the word is out. If you have important things, want to claim priority, <laughs> launch it at EML <laughs> webinar, it's the fastest way. There's no <laughs> video, you just, just online. <laughs> okay. John, here's that. Yeah, I know I need a right mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That's yeah. good. Oh, maybe, uh, 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 Jimmy, you want to say a few things about uh, maybe show a slide about EML? <clears throat> oh, the okay. So, you want me to share that slide or why not? Yeah, okay. uh, probably good. So it uh, will be recorded. Other people can also see it in the video. Okay, let me see if I can find it oh. uh, here. Uh, let me do that. Okay, I'll share my screen. Please do. Okay, uh, just want to share one piece of good news. Uh, the uh, 2019 Scopus site score just came out. So this is the uh, EML webinar series. And uh, uh, EML is a, a Elsevier publication and Scopus is this Elsevier uh, measure of impact. And site score just came out. Uh, it's 7.9. Last year, our uh, site score, 2018 site score was uh, 4.54. So we have uh, improved significantly thanks to all the, uh, the authors and the reviewers and the editors and everybody who contributed to this. And again, let me uh, repeat what's in the uh, Michael's advertisement that the uh, uh, flyer uh, EML extreme mechanics, mechanics letters seeks to publish research of uh, indeed immediacy, depth and originality. Okay, so that's it. Let me stop sharing and go back to our, the main feature of tonight. So, uh... Uh, Michael, uh, please share your screen and, uh, and Han Chin will introduce you. All right. Okay. So um, welcome. Um, morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. So uh, it's my uh, privilege to introduce uh, today's EML webinar speaker, uh, Professor Michael Dickey from uh, North Carolina State University. I'm Han Jing Jiang from Arizona State University. I will be today's uh, moderator. Uh, so Professor Dickey has done lots of work on polymers, but today's talk is talking about something extremely soft. So we learned the, what's the overlap, what's the transition from polymer to, to liquid, and uh, that what's a great story from polymers to liquid. So what we can learn from this transition? 
So now I'm going to pass the uh, speaker to uh, Professor Michael Dickey. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep, great. All right, well, thank you for the introduction and thank you so much to the folks at EML for inviting me. I'm very honored and excited to have this opportunity. And thank you all for everyone who has logged in. I know there's people here from all different time zones. And I, I do appreciate you being here. Uh, I think by three, at least three people being here, this sets the record for me by the most people uh, that I've ever spoken to in my living room. So, <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I've tried to make the talk general enough that everybody should be able to understand regardless of background. But I also know that some of my friends that uh, work on liquid metals are also here. And so I've also tried to include some new stuff that maybe you haven't seen. So hopefully it's, it's a nice blend. Before I, I get into the talk about the liquid metals, strangely the slides, there we go. Um, before I talk about liquid metals, I thought I would just tell you a little bit about our group. So we work on interfaces, patterning, and soft materials, which is kind of sufficiently vague to <laughs> capture a lot of what we do. So Hanching mentioned that we have done some work on polymers. And so this is a, a short video that shows uh, self-folding. This is work done in collaboration with my good friend, Jan Ginzer. So basically we're using light to trigger shape change from a 2D sheet to a 3D object. I'm showing this mostly as a teaser, so I'm not really gonna talk about this, but be happy to talk about it uh, during the question and answer session um, after the talk. But today I am gonna be focusing on liquid metals. And the title of my talk was hopefully fun, maybe a bit provocative, but mentioned liquid metals at the extreme. And so I'm gonna try to convince you that liquid metals has some best in class properties that uh, make it very interesting. And so I'm gonna kind of break things down into two parts. The first is to talk about those properties and, and what it enables. And then the second part of my talk, which will be a little bit shorter, we'll talk about uh, modulating interfacial tension, which I hope will be of interest to this community. So the, the motivation for this first part is this notion that uh, current robots and electronics and a lot of devices that are in our day-to-day -day lives tend to be made out of rigid materials as shown on the left but they interface with the human body. And of course the human body is made out of entirely soft materials. So there's great interest in trying to make robots and electronics and devices potentially softer to do not only new things, but also to interact with humans. And of course, conductors are a big part of these types of devices and liquid metals are really unique in the sense that they offer the best combination of softness and conductivity. So if you want a stretchable conductor, you want it to be stretchable and conductive. And so this plot on the left, and Henshin, can you see my, my um, cursor if I move it on my computer screen? Yes, I can see it, yes. Okay, great. So if you see on this y-axis, this is conductivity, which of course you wanna be up here as conductive as possible. And this over here on the, the x-axis is the strain. So you want something that's as stretchable as possible. In general, with composites, which are shown here in the yellow, there's a trade-off. You can make things stretchable, but not very conductive, or highly conductive and not very stretchable. Liquid metals break this trade-off, and so you kind of get the best of both worlds. So I've got a short video with some sound. I hope you'll be able to hear it. This is a liquid metal wire encased in elastomer. And you'll see, and here, that the wire, the wire has metallic conductivity, so while you stretch it, it maintains metallic conductivity, but it's got mechanical properties like a rubber band. And so this really does give you, you know, basically you can add the metal without any consequence to the mechanical properties. So how do you pick a liquid metal? Um, it's sort of unfortunate that most people, when they think of liquid metal, they think of mercury, which of course is toxic and we'd like to avoid it. There's a few other elements on the periodic table that have low melting points, but they tend to be explosively reactive or radioactive. And so of course we don't wanna use those. And so really by process of elimination, that only leaves gallium on the periodic table. And you'll notice that's sort of important and I'll drive, drive home this point in a second that it's right below aluminum on the periodic table. So that kind of makes them brothers or sisters in the sense that they're gonna have similar properties. But there's one major difference, and that is that gallium has a low melting point. So this is a crystal of gallium and it melts at 30 degrees Celsius. For my American friends, uh, that's about 85 or 86 Fahrenheit. So if you held it in your hand, it would be enough to melt it. 
But to ensure that it, it stays as a liquid, we add in other metals. So in this case, um, using indium, and it's for, sort of through one of the, the magics of nature is you mix these two things together uh, with different melting points and you get something that's even lower. And we do this by picking the composition with the lowest melting point, which is called the eutectic. So I'll try not to use jargon, but you might see this word e-gain um, appear in several places. And that, that just refers to this kind of composition. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about what makes this <laughs> material sort of extreme. And it has several accolades that make it sort of the best in category. And it can show you this through a video. So this is a syringe full of this liquid metal and you can extrude it from the syringe no problem because it's got low viscosity. In fact, it's bulk viscosity is like water. It does have metallic conductivity. It's about an order of magnitude less conductive than copper. And you see that if you slosh it around, it, it spreads and it holds its shape due to a very thin oxide layer that forms on the metal. Now you can dissolve that oxide layer off using acid or base. In this case, we're using base, sodium hydroxide. And when you do that, the metal speeds up because it has the largest surface tension of any liquid at room temperature. It's, it's huge. It's about seven times that of water. So as you might expect, if you've ever broken a mercury thermometer, it tends to form a sphere. That's because of the large surface tension. Now, there's a couple of other things that are kind of interesting and remarkable. One is that it's got zero vapor pressure. So why is that important? Well, that means you don't need to worry about breathing it. It also means you can put it in high vacuum chamber and it will not evaporate. That's very unusual for liquids. And then finally, a lot of times people say, oh, it's a liquid metal, it must be toxic. But I would argue that toxicity does not scale with melting point. And in fact, my colleague, Jin Gu, came up with this idea of using liquid metal for a drug delivery and it uh, turned out to work and um, we're able to put little droplets of liquid metal um, in, into mice. In addition, one of my former students and her husband, kind of a, a powerhouse uh, science couple, uh, went in and carefully studied the cytotoxicity of gallium and showed that it, it appears to be safe. Gallium has also been FDA approved for a number of applications. So I'm not quite to the point where I wanna, you know, drink it or, or eat it, but, uh, but I do feel very safe handling it. Uh, and, and it's been uh, so far, no problems that we know of. So I wanna, this is really the most important point. So if I've somehow lost you, uh, please come back because this, this is really a key point. And that is that this liquid metal oxidizes. And I showed that in the previous video, when you remove it, it the metal just beads up. Now, the fact that it oxidizes is really not that surprising. Most, many re metals will react with air and form an oxide and some of them form a passivating oxide. Passivating means it forms and it doesn't get thicker. And so this is a, a picture of aluminum foil, which you probably have in your kitchen. And you'll notice that aluminum foil never has rust on it. And that's because the oxide forms and forms a barrier so that the, the aluminum underneath it doesn't react with the air that surrounds it. It's like a protective layer. And so we've looked at little droplets of liquid metal uh, through a transmission electron microscope. And we found that this, you can see the oxide layer, it's, it's a few nanometers thick and it forms and kind of to a first approximation, it doesn't really get thicker. So it's, you know, think of it as about three nanometers thick layer. Okay, so why is this a big deal? And this is gonna be probably the most mechanics part of my, my talk. And that is to talk about the, the reality, the way that this stuff flows. So we've studied this in a number of ways, one of which is shown in this cartoon. So we have a, a bottom plate shown here, a top plate, and then we put the liquid metal in between. And if you do a, a cutaway view, you'll see that the liquid metal, um, what you're really measuring is the mechanics of this oxide, solid-like oxide skin that's three nanometers thick because the bulk viscosity is like water. So in terms of the rheometer, it's, it's almost like it's not there. So I'll show you this video. And in this video, we're gonna tell the instrument to turn to the right, turn to the left, and then we're gonna let it go. And it was maybe a little jittery as it played, but there's kind of two takeaways here. One is that you can see the oxide wrinkle, so you can physically see that it's there. And the other is when we let it go, it's got a little bit of elasticity to it. And so from these types of measurements, you can get, a, you have a plot of the uh, elastic surface modulus. So this has units of Newtons per meter instead of the usual Newtons per meter squared. Um, plotted as a function of surface stress, which is kind of how hard you push on this oxide kind of, or I should say pull. Um, and so what you'll see is that just sort of like Hooke's law, uh, this is a material property that the oxide skin is elastic. 
And so it's got this sort of this modulus. And then it suddenly, if you push too hard, boom, it breaks. And so if you kind of trace this down, you'll see that it breaks somewhere around 0.3 to 0.5 Newtons per meter. So that's like a really large surface tension if you want to think about it in terms of like a physical force. Now, this original work, we only looked at gallium indium and more recently, one of my uh, really good colleagues, assistant professor here at NC State, uh, Lillian Chow, um, and I worked together to, along with some students, to measure different alloys of gallium. So there's gallium, liquid gallium, gallium indium, gallium indium 10, which is called gallenstein. And you'll see that all of these things all kind of collapse onto the same plot. And this is significant because it means that regardless of what you add to the bulk to, to lower the, um, the melting point, the oxide layer is primarily gallium oxide. So that's kind of the key takeaway here. Now there are exceptions, but in this case, it's, it's gallium oxide. So why am I making such a big deal about this oxide? Well, what it allows you to do is pattern the metal into shapes that would normally not be possible. So in this video, we show a syringe, we suck the liquid metal back in the syringe, you can see the oxide wrinkle, um, and we dispense the, uh, the liquid metal from a syringe, and you can see that you can stack droplets. And so for the first time, you can actually 3D print metals truly at room temperature with, without any centering. Uh, the oxide layer, of course, sort of as implied here, forms so fast and is sufficiently strong that it can hold these structures up against gravity. You can also do a burst of pressure and it will shoot out a fiber and oxidize in midair. And that, that uh, structure is a little bit like a garden hose. You can drag it around and, uh, and move it. And then this is a, a dead bug, actually, that one of my students found. And um, he did this just kind of for fun, but it's, it's a really nice illustration of how small these structures are. They're about 100-ish 100, uh, 100 microns in diameter. And this is truly you know, printing metals at room temperature. So since this uh, um, initial work by this really great student, Colin Ladd, uh, there's been a, a lot of advances in this field. And I'm not going to really talk about them today, but um, I do point out the, the works of other people in this community, um, it's probably not uh, exhaustive, but we did publish recently kind of a progress report and a review that I, if you're interested in this, I hope you'll take a look at, and that just, just recently came out. One of the other cool things about liquid metal is that, you know, you can pattern it in, in ways that just simply aren't possible with solid metals. So in the previous video, I showed you 3D printing. You can also inject it. And so in this, this video, there's a, a microfluidic channel, which you can faintly see, I hope. And there's a single inlet over which we place a droplet of liquid metal. Now, if you look carefully, you can see the reflection of my student. And he's placed this entire thing into a chamber. The chamber pulls air, um, the chamber is under vacuum and pulls air out of the PDMS, the silicone, and out of the microchannels so that when you return the whole thing back to atmospheric pressure, uh, as you will hopefully see in this video, the student's going to come up, turn the valve, which will let the air back into the chamber. Now this atmospheric pressure is going to push the metal and force it into these microchannels in a hands-free manner. So it's a very simple way to, to pattern metals, like I said, in a hands-free manner. And so we've used this to make things like antennas. Uh, this is a dipole antenna. On the right is a coil antenna, which is used for wireless power uh, transmission, like an inductor. And so this really is a very, very simple way to, to pattern metals. Okay, let me see. So, you know, when we first started working on this, we sort of adapted what and we and other people really were adapting materials that were used in the microfluidics community, basically silicones that you can buy commercially from Dow. And these are great materials um, in many ways for making microchannels, but they tend to tear. And so they're not really great for showing a highly durable and stretchable device. So I'm going to show you three different ways we've tried to address this problem. The first is to simply replace the PDMS with a self-healing polymer. So this is a liquid metal wire, which uh, you can see, and it's inside of a special polymer that's held together by hydrogen bonds. Now, if you come in with a pair of scissors, you can cut this thing in half. And of course, you break it mechanically and you break it electrically. 
Now the key thing is it's a little hard to see, but the liquid doesn't come oozing out like you might expect. And that's because that oxide forms so fast it prevents it from leaking. It's a little bit like when you cut your skin and you start bleeding, you form a scab. And this, here the scab forms in like microseconds. Now because it's flushed with the interface and you bring it back together, the metal will heal by merging back together. And the polymer, if you give it about 10 minutes or so, will reconnect those hydrogen bonds and regain its original modulus. So there's no games here, there's no light or heat, you just wait and uh, you can come back and kind of pull on it and it's, it's gone back together. Uh, there's a really nice review I'd like to bring to your attention by Mike Bartlett, who's a, kind of a rising star in this field, um, moving to Virginia Tech, uh, and Carmel Majidi, who's also one of the leaders in this field, and I hope that you'll uh, check that out. So another way to get around this issue of silicone is, again, using different materials. So instead of a self-healing material, actually using uh, tough materials. And there's lots of, of great work in the literature on making um, tough gels and, and uh, elastomers using what's called double networks, which is kind of illustrated in this uh, cartoon. And I'm not going to go into that mechanism, but basically when you try to get, make a tough material, you want to have something that is elastic so that when you pull on it, it will return to its original shape, but also dissipate energy as you pull on it. So a rubber band is elastic, but it's not, doesn't really dissipate energy because it's just so easy to, to stretch. And so this is a, a molecular approach to doing this, but we've kind of taken more of a macro scale approach. And to understand this, um, and again, I'm, I'm not a mechanics person, so please excuse me if I misuse a term here, but um, please consider the difference of the stress strain behavior of a metal in general versus an elastomer. A metal has a big slope, which means a, a big initial slope, which means a big modulus. It's very hard to, to stretch it. And then at a low strain, it breaks. Whereas an elastomer goes to high strain, but requires very little stress, relatively speaking. So what we would like is kind of the, to make a tough material is to make the, the best of both worlds. So we would have go to high stress and then high strain. And the reason you want that is the area under that is toughness. So you think about force times distance is energy. Well, same thing, stress times strain is energy, which is just the area underneath this curve. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, it's really simple, actually. We take a, a, an elastomeric tube, we put in liquid metal and we freeze it. So we use gallium because it, it will actually, you can actually freeze it at room temperature. And when you pull on it, you can break the metal. Now, normally that would be catastrophic, but in this case, because of the polymer shell, it holds the whole thing together and you actually get multiple breaks. So let me show you a video to kind of illustrate this. This is um, one of these wires. This was done, actually worked by Chris Cooper, who I'm very proud of. He's now a PhD student in uh, Jen and Bao's group at Stanford. But anyway, Chris, um, created this video, I'll play it. So pull on it and the initial slope is huge because you're pulling on metal. And then at some point it will break and you'll see a break here. And when that breaks, the stress momentarily drops. But then there's these bridges of polymer and every time it breaks, it basically goes to high stress again, breaks, goes to high stress, breaks. And it does this multiple times. Now, it's not a perfect analogy, but imagine if you were to get in a bad car accident or something like that, and you have a, a bone break. Well, if your bones break, that's a way of your body dissipating energy. And fortunately, you have the tissue, the soft tissue that surrounds your, your bones so that your arm doesn't fall off, your leg doesn't fall off. And I know that sounds a little bit silly, but that's kind of the, the, the idea here is that we're taking advantage of these kind of disparate properties. The, the, the bars on this, um, this this chart uh, represent the length of the metal. So basically you can see the metal gets longer and then it doesn't get any longer, but instead of getting longer, it starts breaking into pieces, which is what these, um, these bars are on this chart. The end result is something that's very tough, about four times tougher than human skin and quite stretchable. So we can go to like four or 500% strain before it breaks. So just to show you kind of a demonstration here on the left, this is a elastomeric fiber. So this is, has liquid metal uh, on the inside. And this is the same fiber, but with solid metal. So when I hit play and we drop this little fishing weight, you'll see that the elastomer one just drops immediately. Whereas the one on the right slowly falls as it dissipates energy as it's, as it's elongating. So as it's doing this, first again, it strains the metal, but then it starts breaking the metal. 
and until it, it'll eventually fall. Just the bottom. Types of fibers, um, when you solidify the metal, uh, can actually be used as shape memory materials. And there's some great work in the literature um, by professors Floriano and Shepard and, and, and others uh, that have taken advantage of this. And we've um, had kind of this contribution to the literature as well, where we've taken these same fibers that are solid and hold their shape. But as soon as you put them in, for example, warm water, they will immediately melt, um, or very quickly melt, I should say, and become soft, just like a piece of rubber. And so I, I want to bring this to your attention because there's this opportunity to have huge changes in stiffness based on the phase of the liquid metal. Okay, so I've shown you two ways so far of dealing with the fact that silicones are not a great material for stretchable devices. Uh, but there's a third way that we've sort of attacked this problem. And that was just to say, well, silicones are great in many ways. What if we added in a molecule that would warn us if the material was about to break. And this was done by a really great graduate student down the road at Duke, uh, Meredith Barbie and Steve Craig's lab, who we had a great time collaborating with. And she used this molecule that's called spiropyrin, which looks like this. And you can see that it's a ringed molecule. So when you pull on this ring molecule with enough stress, as you'll see in this video, uh, this clear material is PDMS with this molecule. When you reach a certain uh, critical stress, you'll see that it will change color to purple. And so this offers you a way of sort of warning somebody or warning a user that the material is about to fail. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a visual cue. Now, this idea of color change, and I'm switching gears here a little bit, but this idea of color change got us kind of thinking in new directions. And you think about color change is useful in our day-to-day -day lives for all sorts of things. Um, expression, whether you know we blush, um, it's used by in nature's uh, for camouflage. And if you're looking at a computer screen right now, which presumably you are, um, you're looking at something that is like, you know, a display, a human machine interface. Um, and so we I had this really great visiting student, Yang Jin, who's uh, came up with this idea of taking these pigments, thermochromic pigments, and using liquid metal to jewel heat these, these pigments so that they change color. And, um, and so this is really not surprising, I would say. These are just commercial pigments and we've simply mixed them into the silicone. And you can pattern the liquid metal to create patterns. Basically it's thermal patterns, which you can see visually because these pigments change color. So again, not too surprising. It looks beautiful, but not surprising. Um, and kind of you know another step with this is you can take let's just say red and blue pigments which trigger different temperatures mix them together to get purple now if you run a little bit of current through it you can make the red disappear so now it appears blue and then if you run a more current through you can make the blue disappear because now it's at a warmer temperature and it looks white and then you just wait unfortunately it's slow because it's a thermal process but you have to wait for it to cool back down and it will go back to its original um, color and uh, condition okay again i would say beautiful but not surprising where this gets really interesting is in the following so here we've got a liquid metal wire that's inside of an elastomer with this purple combination of pigments there's blue and there's red combined together so it looks purple now we're gonna run current through it, but not enough to change the color. However, when you strain these liquid metal wires, they get longer, but they also get narrower in diameter. And so if you watch this, basically we're running current through it the whole time, but it's not until you reach kind of a critical stress or critical strain that it starts changing color. And we can tune where that strain occurs based on the geometry of the wire. So this is a kind of a way again to give kind of colorimetric indicators of, of where your strain is at. And this effectively couples mechanical, electrical, and optical properties, um, kind of in a hand-waving sense. All right, so this starts to get more interesting, but where it got really, this work got really interesting is the following, and, and you'll have to kind of use a little bit of an imagination here. But the basic idea is that if you have an object, and I actually have an apple sitting here, um, and if you were to try to pick up that object, the first thing you would do typically is you would use your eyes to look at it, but you wouldn't even necessarily need that. You could kind of feel around until you found it. When you touch it, 
you're, there's a signal that's sent to your brain that without you even thinking, it tells you how to respond, how to move your muscles, how hard to hold it, et cetera, et cetera. And if you were going to build a robot to do this, I think the intuitive thing to do would just be to mimic that. So take a camera or some kind of sensor, a computer chip to mimic the brain, and then, um, and then a motor to give a response. So the problem with doing this, as you might imagine, is that if you know if you're probably familiar with the movie Star Wars, this is C-3PO and his hand, his arm has been knocked off, and you can see there's tons of wires going through here. So if you wanted to make something, and I, I don't know that this number is exactly right, but I, I think someone told me there's about a million sensors, um, like nerves, in your in your arm. So imagine trying to wire up something that can mimic the complexity that's found in nature. It's be really really difficult to do. And so there's this interest in, well, can we just completely eliminate the brain altogether? Could we have a material that when you touch something, the material itself knows how to decide appropriately how to respond? And now that I've said that, I will tell you that um, what I'm going to show you is a very, very modest step in this direction, but hopefully this kind of gets you excited and thinking. Um, and this sounds a little bit like science fiction, but it turns out that an octopus right straight out of mother nature, has something like two thirds of its neurons in its arms. So this is pretty fascinating because it means that the arms in principle could be making decisions um, absent of direction from a centralized processor, which would be the brain, which they do have a brain, but it's just a, a smaller portion of their neurons. Whereas vertebrates like humans, most of our neurons are in our, in our brain inside of our skull. So sometimes you might hear this called distributed logic because instead of doing things centrally, things are distributed um, you know, to the, the arms or the periphery. All right, so now that I've said all that, again, this is very, very modest, but here, here's how we did it. We have a very simple circuit of liquid metal. There's A, B, and C, and current roughly goes through these one third, one third, one third, if you'll think of it that way. We flip it over and this is region C, so it looks purple. We're running current through it, but not enough to see a, a color change. We then start the experiment where we start pushing in region A. When you do that, you squish the liquid metal here, redirecting current to region C, evoking a response in a kind of in a distal place in a different place than when you're pushing. Now we push A and B and we get a different response. So you can start imagining making a truth table where depending on how you press a material, you get a different outcome. Again, there's no computer chip here. It's entirely soft and we're able to do very basic logic. Now there's some limits here and I'm happy to talk about that uh, during the question and answer. But I would like to point out that, you know, we did this with color change because you can see it, but there's other ways that you can do this as well. Um, you can make other circuits to use the electricity to instead of doing joule heating to let's say cause a motor to turn. So this is a very simple circuit with A and B. And if you press A, you'll see there's an LED that turns on and a motor that turns on. If you press A and B, then only the LED turns on. And if you press zero of them, then they both turn off. So this is just to say that you can, there's different ways to start thinking about this, but you're essentially, you're redirecting electricity. Okay, so in the prior work, we basically used the, the kind of squishy nature of liquid metal to change resistance. Now here, I'm gonna kind of switch gears a bit and talk about changing capacitance. And there's lots of examples in the literature of people that have made soft capacitors that look just like this. And they measure capacitance uh, by touching by looking at the change in distance. The distance is the height or the thickness of this dielectric layer. And so if you decrease D by squishing it, you make the capacitance bigger. So this is a way to measure touch. So if you want to improve sensitivity, there's a couple things you can do. One is you can increase the dielectric constant, but that's a bit tricky because you want the material to be soft. So you can also make it soft, so make it easier to touch in response to a smaller force. And you could also possibly, it's tricky to think about how to do this, but to make the dielectric a function of distance. So somehow when you squish it, you change its properties. So we took some inspiration from the literature and there's lots of examples and I didn't mean to exclude anybody here, but kind of two of the, the papers that came to mind for me was some work from Jen and Bao's group to make um, uh, silicone essentially softer. So instead of making your capacitor look like this, which is just a slab of silicone and kind of hard to squish, they use this kind of elegant solution of using pyramids or structured silicone. So that's one trick. 
But remember, silicones don't have great dielectric properties. So there's some really nice work from Carmel Majidi's group and, and others uh, that have mixed liquid metal into elastomer to increase the dielectric constant. So taking this concept, we, we kind of combine these things. And so to, to, I want to pause for one second. It's kind of like a little commercial break here. But just to point out one of the really cool things about liquid metals, it's very easy to make particles. It, it really couldn't be easy, any easier. One way to do it is to simply take liquid metal and sonicate it, just basically shake it. And it breaks up into droplets. They are very small, hundreds of nanometers. And uh, this is a vial of liquid metal droplets. Very easy to make. You can also stir it. So literally by hand or a high shear mixer, which um, Martin Thuo's group at Iowa State has been uh, championing. And then you can also use microfluidics. So this video shows, um, it's a high speed camera video showing us squeezing liquid metal, which is, appears black here because it's backlit, through a, a little orifice. And you can make, you know, 100 micron-ish droplets um, that are very stable due to this oxide layer. So we actually use this stirring technique to make um, a liquid metal foam. So this is, this is kind of a conceptual uh, idea of, of what we're doing. We take the liquid metal elastomer, so liquid metal droplets mixed in with silicone. We make a foam out of it, and when you squish it, um, you increase the dielectric constant because you're displacing air. This is similar to the bow concept. And what you'll see is that the capacitance, which is the thing you're going to measure as a function of stress, increases. It increases initially because you're displacing the air that's in the foam. So imagine squeezing like a, a sponge or something like that. But then once all the air is gone, the, uh, the slope changes and it doesn't work quite as well. So you get a really good um, initial capacitance change. These numbers here refer to the, uh, the percentage of liquid metal that's in the silicone. So the more that you add, the more sensitive it gets. And the beauty of this is it gets more sensitive without getting stiffer. So by adding more liquid metal, you get this blue data where you get really big changes in capacitance. Now, I wanted to, to say something, and I hope this is not too controversial, but there's some, some literature that uses this definition of sensitivity, which is change in capacitance, so how much this goes up, divided by the initial capacitance. And if you think about this for a few seconds, you realize that there's a little bit of a flaw here. And that is that if you want to make your sensitivity appear very high, you make C0 to be effectively zero, making your sensitivity to appear infinite. But that's really kind of silly because you don't want to have an initial capacitance at zero. You want to have a good initial signal. And you'll see that down here at zero strain, zero stress, we get an enhanced initial signal. So if we use this metric, it doesn't look as good. But in terms of practice, um, this is actually a quite, quite a nice result. The other thing we, we observed that I think is actually makes this work quite interesting is we went back and um, measured the dielectric constant, which was reported here as a function of strain. Now, if you just take pure silicone that you can just buy a commercial kit, you'll see this, it's got a very low dielectric constant and it doesn't really change very much with, with compression. However, if you start adding liquid metal, so as you move up all the way to here, this is 40%, you'll see that the dielectric constant goes up at zero strain, but it also uh, changes as you compress it. Now this initial change um, is, we call it piezo permittivity. It's kind of a fancy word to say that the dielectric constant is changing and it's positive, it's increasing. You can see that because of the shape. And it does this for a very simple reason, just because you have a foam, you're displacing air and replacing it with polymer. Where this gets really surprising and interesting is to the right of this, you'll see that once we get rid of all the air, we actually start seeing a negative piezo permittivity. In other words, the dielectric constant decreases. And we believe that this is due, and I, again, I'm teasing you here a little bit, and I'm not showing you all the details, but I'd be happy to talk more about it. We believe that the liquid droplets are actually getting squished and changing the shape of the filler within this composite. So this is kind of exciting because you could actually make capacitors that change geometry without actually changing capacitance. So you can make stretchable and soft capacitors that don't change their capacitance as you deform them. The other kind of neat thing is because we use foams, we're able to make a really soft material. So this is the elastic modulus of every kind of silicone we could easily find online. Um, and you can see that most of the commercial elastomers fall in this range. If you take one of those and make it into a foam, you get it to be much softer, which is intuitive. 
but however, the dielectric pr permittivity is quite low. So the cool thing here is we can have really soft material, but have a large change in permittivity. The same concept of kind of a piezo responsive material um, is, is interesting in other ways as well. And this was a collaboration with friends from Wollongong. Uh, Xiang Tang is, um, is one of the kind of the rising young stars in this field and has done a lot of beautiful work. Um, in this particular example, um, they're, the team mixed liquid metal with iron powder and PDMS. So in the previous work, I showed you a foam. The difference here is this is just a slab of material and it has solid particles mixed in as well. I want to—I I should have said this if I didn't up front. I didn't really contribute all that much to this, and I'm just showing this to this community because I think the results are quite interesting. So in this work, um, take this composite material and you can measure the, uh, the resistance. And what you find is that the conductivity increases with strain. And I'm, I'm emphasizing that because it's very unusual. To help you understand why this is so unusual, this is some really nice work out of the Samaya group in Japan, where they took silver, silver flake, this is a very common uh, material to use in stretchable conductors, mixed it with rubber and solvent, and they made this nice ink, and you can see that it's stretchable. But when you measure the conductivity, you can find that as you stretch it, the conductivity decreases and eventually it, it breaks and fails. So I'm emphasizing here, typically when you stretch a material or deform it, you decrease the conductivity. And the reason for that is kind of easy to um, intuit. That is if you have a percolated network of particles through which uh, charge can flow, if you stretch them, you move them farther apart. Very simple to understand. You just increase the, the uh, resistance because it's more difficult for charge to, to pass through the particles. But if you add liquid metal particles, when you stretch the composite or deform it, you actually just deform the liquid metal and thereby um, potentially could be changing the conductivity. And in fact, that is the case. And this is just an example where um, the researchers here measured the resistance, uh, res resistivity, excuse me, um, versus strain. And you'll see that the resistance, resistivity, excuse me, goes way down. This is orders of magnitude change. Uh, two or three orders of magnitude change over 10% strain. So this is very, very sensitive. So one of the consequences of this, and there's you know millions of ways to make strain sensors, but you can put this, for example, on a soft material and you can change the resistance as you deform it. And the cool thing here is that this is on a log scale. So here's at rest, you bend your finger and it goes up by a hundred. So it's actually a really you know, big change in your signal. Now, um, in this prior work, and I don't know why my little graphic is not showing up here, but um, in this prior work that, I, that I've shown, and maybe I should go back, these sort of composites are highly loaded with liquid metal. They've got something like 80, 90% uh, filler. And so one of the things that we've actually just paper just came out this week um, was this, this work with the collaboration from some really amazing students from, uh, from Singapore um, a couple of undergrads and a, and a graduate student all working together. <clears throat> I'm shown here in this picture with um, Professor Matthews. So basically what we did is we took liquid metal particles and put them into silicone, but did not cure the silicone. Instead, we applied a, a voltage across these electrodes and we used that to assemble the particles. And the really cool thing is because they're liquid particles, they merge together into a continuous uh, chain. And to give you some appreciation, we're able to make microwires using five to 10% weight loading of the, uh, the liquid metal, whereas composites tend to require 80 or 90% to get percolation. So, okay, so this is in some ways not all that surprising, but where it gets really kind of cool is that you can use this ink, I call it an ink because it's just, you know, it's, it's liquid metal mixed in with uh, silicone. You can make it to self heal a circuit. So here the students um, came in with a scalpel and completely cut apart their, their, uh, their circuit. Now it's ins insulating, completely resistive. And then come in with some of this ink, fill it in there. Remember, it's not conductive. Just because you have liquid metal in there is not, does not make it conductive. However, if you apply the voltage, you can assemble those particles 
and heal it, making it, you know, a metallic conductor. And then you can heal, uh, excuse me, cure the silicone, which will heal it mechanically. And so this is kind of cool because if you have a damaged circuit, you could just put some of this ink in, heal it, and it will be stretchable and highly conductive. Oh, here's my cartoon. I'm sorry that didn't appear. So again, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this is a typical composite material where you have to put high loading and you need high enough loading to get these particles to percolate. But in our case, we can do low loading. And so you can actually assemble the particles. And, and one of the beauties here is that if you, um, you can get inadvertent um, conductivity in regions where you don't necessarily want it, where here we can direct the particles to be exactly where we want it. Okay, so I think I'm, I'm right on time and have enough chance here. I have a chance here to tell you this second part of this talk, which is um, to me scientifically probably the most exciting. And that is we've, we and others have shown that we can control the interfacial tension of liquid metals over an enormous range. Um, and I would say an extreme range. And so that leads to some interesting applications. So this is a vial of liquid metal sitting in sodium hydroxide. Remember, sodium hydroxide keeps the metal free of oxide. So when you shake it, you can break it into droplets, but it very quickly beads back up and forms a sphere because, of course, a sphere minimizes the surface area and therefore the surface energy. So one thing about this liquid is it's got the largest surface tension of any liquid known to man at room temperature. And it's not even close. It's, you know, it's seven or eight times bigger than water. Okay, so how do you lower the surface tension? Well, one way to do it is surfactants, but that doesn't really work very well. Um, it only gives modest changes. And so um, I got a little ahead of myself, I'm sorry. <clears throat> so in this, in this video, we're actually using electrochemistry to remove the oxide. So I, I'm sorry, I lost my flow here a little bit, but in the, in the previous video, we, I'm gonna go back. In the previous video, we did this in sodium hydroxide, so there was no oxide. But in this video, um, this is done by Rashid Khan, who's uh, now uh, assistant professor in Nevada. Uh, he used a little puddle of salt water and applied a voltage, and that electrochemically removes the oxide. So the beautiful thing here is that you can uh, use voltage to turn on and off capillary behavior. And this is just simply by a reduction reaction. You're, you're inserting electrons into the metal. It causes the oxide to convert back into gallium. Okay, so what is this good for? Well, we showed just kind of a cute thing. We put liquid metal in a maze. We put a little droplet of, of water electrolyte over here, and there's a droplet of metal over here. We apply a voltage and that removes the oxide from this leading edge. And when you remove the oxide, remember it wants to form a sphere. And so it spontaneously withdraws and forms this spherical shape. And by the way, it solves the maze, which is kind of cool. So the, the electrical path in this maze is the solution. And so it's basically just following the electrical path. Now this is cool. I mean, it looks really kind of neat and cute, but the, the real challenge is, you know, the physics here are a little bit obvious and that is you're just, it just wants to beat up to minimize the surface energy. How do you get it to go back in? And naively, you might think, well, instead of applying negative one volts, which is how we remove the oxide, what if you apply positive one volt? The problem with that is that if you use positive voltage, you're just going to deposit oxide on the surface and it shouldn't do anything. So you can imagine how surprised we were when we did this experiment. So this is, this is a droplet of eutectic gallium indium sitting in sodium hydroxide. So there's no oxide layer. And we're going to apply positive one volt, which in principle, what you should expect is that the surface should oxidize, maybe a few nanometers, which means you're not going to see it, and nothing will happen. But we did this experiment, and you can't see the counter electrode. It's sitting somewhere out of the field of view. But we apply the voltage, and um, it's playing a little bit herky-jerky on my screen, um, which is not what happens in reality. <clears throat> but basically, the metal flattens like a pancake. And that's really, really strange because that means the surface tension is, is quite low. So we've been, gosh, for the last five, six years trying to understand this and we're still somewhere along that, that journey. Uh, but I'll tell you a little bit about what we do know. Okay, so this is one more video that just shows you're looking top down, shows the metal kind of squishing into a mold. So gravity is causing it to squish into the mold due to its low surface tension. And then when you turn the voltage off, the oxide goes away and the metal beads back up. 
Okay, so what is happening here? And I don't really have time to go too deeply into the theory and, and everything that we've done, but this experiment is, is pretty, um, kind of helps elucidate what's happening. So this is a droplet of the liquid metal. And again, it's sitting in sodium hydroxide, so there's no oxide layer on it. What you can't see is there's a little electrode poking into the bottom of this droplet. And it needs to be little so that we can see the shape of the drop. Based on the shape of the drop, we can get the surface tension. So right now, the droplet is a very high surface tension because its gravity is not able to squish it. Surface tension is bigger than gravity, and it causes it to be a sphere. And here, at this high surface tension state, the surface tension is about 500. Remember, if you're not used to these units, the surface tension of water is down here, around 70. So this is a huge surface tension. And I apologize, this is an inconvenience of electrochemistry, but this is at the so-called open circuit voltage. That means we're not applying a voltage. So even though it says negative 1.5, this is just what mother nature gives us when we stick the electrodes into the solution. Now, when I hit go, we're gonna start applying a potential and you'll see the droplet starts to squish, which means the surface tension is getting lower as, as it shows on the plot and it's completely reversible. So we can go back and forth. This is all real time and have huge changes in interfacial tension. Now, what I was not able to tell you due to time constraints is that what the theory tells us is that this, the, the theoretical shape for surface tension versus voltage should be a parabola. And that's due to uh, ions basically charge at this interface that act like a capacitor. And then what actually happens is, is this follows the theory. This is exactly what you would expect from theory from the late 1800s. Uh, but something weird happens right here. And it turns out right here where we get this anomalous behavior, this huge drop in tension, that's exactly where the oxide first starts forming. And in fact, the tension gets lower and lower and lower. And I like to joke that when you see this data, you should be very mad at me because somehow I let my student graduate uh, without taking one more data point. And gosh, wouldn't that be amazing if liquid metal, the, the liquid with the highest tension known to man, could be zero interfacial tension using only one volt. So this is not electrowetting. This is not electrocapillarity. This is something different. And it has to do with surface oxidation. OK, so our, we have kind of two working explanations right now that I think are consistent with all of our data. The first is that when you deposit oxide on the surface, you lower the interfacial tension. And that is not surprising and uh, consistent with some literature. Um, and it's sort of like if you, if you don't know the word surfactant, it's basically something like a soap that goes to the interface between two dissimilar liquids. So in this example, this is oil and water, but in our case, it's liquid metal and uh, sodium hydroxide solution. Now, you know from experience, it's very easy to put soap into water, but it's very difficult to get it back out. In our case, we can apply one volt and get a huge change in tension and then negative one volt and make it go away. So ours is complete, this approach is completely reversible. And so to kind of, it's really hard to explain to people um, how remarkable this is scientifically. Um, and I created a little plot and you'll have to excuse me because I'm taking a little bit of license here, but <clears throat> Just to kind of drive on the point, this is the tension of familiar liquids. So here's water. Just like, you know, if you have a cup of water in front of you, it's just plain old water. Surface tension is 72 using these units of millinewtons per meter. Okay, one way to lower the tension of water is to use soap. And I hope everybody is using lots of soap these days due to, <laughs> due to COVID. But if you do that, you lower the tension from let's say 70 down to 40. That's, that's a big change and you know that can, um, it's very impactful in, in terms of our day-to-day -day lives. However, with liquid metal, it's got the largest tension, it's you know, almost 10 times bigger. And when we apply one volt, you see that the tension's almost zero. We think it's, it could be zero or very close to zero. So these units don't mean much to most people. And so I've taken a little bit of liberty to change it to mass. And I've used pounds, but you could think of this in kilograms as well. So imagine this is a plot of mass. Over here, you've got a dog, which weighs about 70 pounds. And it's heavy, but you could pick it up, no problem. And if you add a little soap to your dog, you would make it smaller, about 40 pounds. So that's lighter, but you couldn't go back and forth. In our case, we've got something that's like a polar bear. 
it's absolutely huge. Polar bears are about six or 700 pounds. But when we apply one volt, we make it like light as a feather. In fact, even lighter, maybe like nothing, maybe like air. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of crazy. And so, you know, we I keep telling you, well, maybe the tension is zero. And we've been working with Karen Daniels to understand this a little bit better. In this experiment, we take a droplet in a Petri dish and we apply a voltage to it and we look from the top down. And right where that data looked like it was gonna hit zero, let me show you what happens. This is looking top down on the liquid metal. We're applying one volt to it. And you'll see that it starts spreading due to gravity. So gravity is squishing it into the screen. But not only does it spread, it starts forming fractals. And these are very likely due to Marangoni type um, instabilities. But the point is that the metal spreads in area and increases in area um, in a way that doesn't seem bound. Uh, the only way it breaks up is if these small little uh, threads break up. And once it breaks up, the oxide dissolves away and it beads up. So it's really the oxide that's doing the, the magic here. It's again, not electrocapillarity, um, not electrowetting. This is due to electrochemistry at the interface. So I guess, yeah, this is my last uh, result slide. And I wanted to, to kind of draw a parallel with, you know, why, one of the reasons this is so fascinating if you take water and, and pump it out of a hose or out of a, out of a faucet, you'll know from experience that it will form a cylinder, but it will quickly break up into droplets. And that is called a Rayleigh plateau instability. It's driven by minimization of surface energy. And if the time, this is really kind of just a scaling argument here, so don't, don't get too caught up in the details, but the time to break up uh, depends on the diameter here, D. And if you want it to break up faster, you make D really small and the surface tension. So if you want it to break up into droplets quickly, you would you want to use something with the high surface tension. So if you do this calculation for water, this stream should break up in about 0 0.01 seconds, 10 milliseconds. So these streams are very unstable. So imagine now if you switch over to liquid metal and this diameter of this nozzle is about 100 microns. So that's the size of a human hair. So we've made D very small and we're using a liquid with the largest tension in the man. So this means it should come out as droplets. And indeed, when we start pumping the metal with no voltage, it comes out as droplets. But then at some point, we start seeing evidence that the tension is lowering. The droplets get smaller and start falling more periodically. And then at some point, it actually forms a wire, suggesting the tension is quite low. Now, if you go to too high a voltage, it actually gets the, the, it gets kind of funky. The surface actually gets to form this thicker, crusty oxide and it behaves very erratically. Now to kind of drive home, you know, are we able to overcome um, Rayleigh plateau instabilities? This video on the right is the tallest container that we could find in our lab that was clear. It's about a, almost a meter tall and liquid metal is dripping out as a wire that is about the size of a human hair. So this thing is not quite a meter. I think it's like you know, half a meter or something like that. But it's imagine something like the length of a human hair made out of liquid metal. And we're doing this using only a very small voltage. So this is sort of my last um, sort of fun slide. Um, this is a comedian from the United States named Seth Myers. I don't know if you all recognize him. He's a late night comedian host. And he somehow saw one of our videos and said the following. This is really cool. This week, scientists at North Carolina State University announced they discovered they discovered way to move and manipulate liquid metal with electricity. And Arnold Schwarzenegger has already been sent back in time to stop it. OK, so I usually joke that that's when we stop doing our research on liquid metal. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to wrap up. I see that we're approaching 11, but I, I thought it, it might be a nice transition to the Q&A to talk about exciting opportunities. And I'm going to do this in two ways. Uh, one, talk about things that I've seen in, in the literature um, from other groups. Uh, and I don't mean to exclude anybody, but just things that have come out recently that seemed very exciting. And then a few things in the mechanics community that might be uh, worth thinking about. So just this past week, there was a paper that came out in Nature that used liquid metal as part of their artificial biomimetic inspired uh, eyeball. So these are actually liquid metal filled tubes that come out the back of this artificial eyeball. And this has gotten a lot of nice publicity. So this takes advantage of this kind of the soft nature of the liquid metal and the unique fabrication opportunities. 
Um, this is some, some work out of RMIT in Australia. And I've actually been really lucky to host um, Khan, who's one of the authors on this, as a Fulbright scholar in my lab. Uh, but these, the authors here used liquid metal particles to help break up biofilms. So right now, all the news is about COVID. But you know, in the, in the future, there's this concern that there's going to be anti, um, you know, that, that, that bacteria will be resistant to antibiotics. And so this is a physical approach to break up such biofilms, which have real health implications. Uh, another kind of exciting venue, and there's multiple examples. This is just one that I picked um, from Kourash and Torben's group um, in Australia, is to use liquid metals and use their reactivity to promote reactions that would normally not be favorable. So they've shown in this paper that you can reduce carbon dioxide into solid carbon species. And the beautiful, one of the beautiful things about using liquid metals is there's poor adhesion between the carbon and the metal. And because it's a liquid, the, the carbon just falls right off. So you don't get so-called coking. And then last but not least is taking advantage of the liquid metal reactivity. You know, the, the nice thing about passivating oxides is that they allow our society to have metals. Without oxides, um, metals would just react and rust and you know, we wouldn't have metallic species. But because it's a liquid metal, we can break it and easily break the oxide layer and expose the underlying metal and use it to promote reactions. So this is some work from uh, Jin Wu Ma, <clears throat> who um, did this experiment where he took monomer, this is a reactive, this is a precursor to form polymer with liquid metal without any chemical initiator. And he sonicated it, which broke the liquid metal into droplets and it caused polymerization. So this suggests that you could use mechanical energy as an input to trigger polymerization, which I think is pretty interesting. And then last but not least, there are opportunities for mechanics. This is just me kind of daydreaming, but this idea of electromechanical coupling. So when you deform something, you change its shape. I think that that's pretty interesting. And, and I've shown some examples here with composites that were, where the fillers change their shape and the composite actually changes its property. The oxide itself, the mechanics of it, I are starting to be understood, but there's opportunities to understand it better. There's wrinkling, there's breaking, there's reformation. Um, the wetting behavior is poorly understood. And then there's this opportunity to do phase change, which uh, allows for variable stiffness, which is uh, very interesting. So to conclude, I, I hope that liquid metal is, uh, have shown you this kind of interesting properties that there's some extreme properties, kind of the best combination of conductivity and stretchability the highest surface tension known to man. And this leads to some really unique opportunities such as stretchable devices, soft sensors, and even 3D printing at room temperature. And then the last part of the talk was to show you that we can change the surface tension from the largest tension possible as a liquid to basically zero um, using one volt. And so I think that this suggests that the oxide is quote unquote the best surfactant uh, ever reported and it's reversible. This work was done with amazing students here at NC State. Um, very lucky, and I um, was not able to mention everyone's name as I, as I spoke. So I would like to point out former students who contributed and, and don't appear in this picture. Um, and I love collaborating with people, and I'm, I hope that I haven't missed anybody in my list here, but, um, but thank you to everyone that's, that's worked together on this. And I'll uh, thank the, the funding uh, folks that have funded this over the years. And I will just conclude by, you know, showing the slide. There's some reviews that are out there, and these are by, you know, by no means the only one. But I hope that you'll uh, you'll reach out to me and um, check out this and try to learn a little bit more. So I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much for the invitation and for your attention. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dickey, for such a wonderful talk with uh, with magics. So. Uh, <laughs> Now we have about uh, uh, 250 uh, participants. I'm pretty sure we will have lots of great questions from all of you. So we can start from the panelists. And when you want to ask questions, you can click the hand shape button on the bottom of your screen. So I can uh, pass, uh, the, uh, pass the virtual microphone to the ask questions. So we can start from the panelists. Hey, Michael. Uh, can we ask you to uh, unshare your screen? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, Jimmy, please. Michael, great talk, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, 
I have a simple question. You, you mentioned that these, uh, at the beginning you showed this aluminum foil and the aluminum foil, the reason that it doesn't become rusty is there's a thin layer, a few nanometers uh, aluminum outside. And that aluminum outside layer would prevent oxygen from penetrating again into a couple of things. One, in, uh, in the case of aluminum, uh, pure aluminum, this aluminum oxide layer is highly compressive. That's why oxygen cannot penetrate. Uh, compared to, for example, iron, you, you form an uh, iron oxide, it's highly porous. Oxygen can continue to go in. This is one thing. Another thing is, another requirement is this oxidation process must be very fast. If it's very slow, you know, many things goes on. It, it doesn't limit to a few nanometers. This very fast process also gives rise to another phenomena, which is if you have aluminum powders, this is combustible. Mm -hmm. Actually, the solid, the solid uh, fuel is made of powders of metal. Uh, do you see that in your liquid metal? Those are all those are all spot on comments and I agree with everything that you said. Um, actually, the compressive part is interesting because I personally think um, and we have some evidence to show that the when we're electrochemically oxidizing the metal that that's actually creating compressive stresses. So, you know, normally we say surface tension, tension, right? Interfacial tension It's because liquids are always um, being pulled into a, shapes that minimize their area and energy. But here, I think we actually have some compressive stresses that actually help push the metal outwards, which is one of the reasons that tension um, appears so low, or maybe maybe even zero, or maybe even negative. Um, and then um, you talked about the exp explosiveness of aluminum powder, which yeah, I've, I've, I'm aware of because we were looking into buying some aluminum powder a while back, and that made me kind of scared. I haven't seen anything or or know of any examples where that's an issue and I, I think you know basically um, for aluminum you you have to have the powder together and so that when you start getting reaction it releases heat which breaks the passivating oxide and allows more aluminum to react and it kind of it's like a runaway reaction so you have very high surface area I think and this is just speculation because I don't know for sure, but I think if you took the, the liquid particles and collected them, first of all, they wouldn't be fluffy. Um, they're not like, you know, it's not like floating through the air. They're dense enough that they would be sitting at the bottom of a container or surface. And then if somehow you scratch them or agitated them, all they're going to do is merge together and form a bigger volume of liquid. So my feeling is that it would not... Um, it would not explode or, or be dangerous. Um, and I've seen no evidence to suggest otherwise, but it's, it's an interesting point that I had never thought about before. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you, a great question. Um, another question from, from the panelist. Uh, I see a question from uh, Jingda Tang. So uh, I, I want, so can, can you hear me? Yes, please yeah. go ahead. Yeah, so uh, thank you for the lecture, Professor Dickey. So my question is, uh, when you use the uh, liquid metal as a conducting wear, how much strength can the liquid metal uh, withstand? And uh, the following question, if you embed the liquid metal into a PDMS, will this critical strength be improved or or decrease. Thank you so much for attending and for asking the question. Uh, I'm smiling because it's it's a question that I've wondered myself. Um, and, and most of the things that we've done, like the the stretchable wire, what happened is the the polymer actually failed before the liquid metal. So it seems like in principle that you could stretch it kind of without bound. Now. 
the reality is, is that as you stretch it, you make the diameter smaller. And so if there are any capillary forces, those forces at some point go through the roof and will very likely make the structure unstable. The closest that we've come to exploring that question is, is actually a paper that we have in Extreme Mechanics Letters, where we took, instead of an elastomer, we took a putty, like think of like silly putty, it's um, viscoelastic material. And we put a droplet of liquid metal and just stretched it. And when you stretch it, uh, the, the polymer undergoes plastic deformation, well, viscoelastic deformation um, and doesn't come back. And my students hated me because it was really a messy experiment because you're trying to hold something that's like bubble gum and stretch it. But, um, but anyway, what we found in that experiment is that if you got it down to about 10 microns in diameter, that it's, it would start breaking. And I suspect that what happens is that at some point when you, if you imagine this is your, your oxide and you break it like that, for a very short period of time, you expose the metal. And so there's some capillary force which can cause it to, to break apart. And if that happens fast enough and it doesn't have a chance to reoxidize, then it might break up. Now that experiment was done in air um, where literally a droplet was just sitting and we just pulled it. You can imagine if you enc enc encase that in some other polymer, you might be able to even go further. Um, but your question is a very good one. I don't, as far as I know, nobody has really um, answered that in a satisfactory way. But if I had to guess, I would say about 10 or one to 10 microns would be the limit of the diameter. But, but let Hopefully. me follow up on that. Does that behavior rate dependent? In other words, when you pull the putty, uh, does the behavior depend on how fast you pull it? Uh, I can only guess because we didn't try it. It's, it's, I mean, it's a great idea. And I would venture a guess to say yes, because you're competing against the rate of oxidation which is happening you know, pretty fast. You'd have to stretch pretty fast. In our experiments, we were literally taking something that was like bubble gum and, and pulling on it. So you can imagine how difficult it is to do that in a controlled way and to do it really rapidly. But um, in principle, I think you, your, your comment is spot on. I, I bet it does matter. It is interesting that to me, this uh, string rate question has been asked by Tom, by Jimmy, and I have same same question. If you pull the wire, you know, liquid metal inside a rubber a tube, you need to pull fast or slow, what's the uh, resistivity depends on the strain rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, over, the, over the, the rates that we can do in our lab and we're not seeing any, any effect. Um, and I guess that's just probably because the oxide forms so fast. If you encase it in a material though, you could, you could imagine slowing down the diffusion of oxygen um, and maybe start playing games there. I, for, the, for the rheology, I was mentioning kind of before the talk started that we've done frequency sweeps of, you know, kind of wiggling it back, that just the liquid metal back and forth. This is not a wire. This is just physically wiggling the oxide layer. And we don't see any uh, frequency dependence over the range that we can, we can study in our rheometer. So I think my guess is there, there probably is some, some rate dependence, but you probably have to go to very high rates to see it. Ajika, please. Yeah. Okay. About your oxide. Um, so, so, so you said yeah, when you stretch uh, liquid, new oxide is formed. Right. Um, so um, now suppose uh, this a new ox this uh, uh, liquid is uh, encased in the metal, or in, in an elastomer, so you make a stretchable conductor. Presumably, uh, if oxygen, uh, oxygen should diffuse through the elastomer, you can still form oxide, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, if you stretch this, you'll form oxide. Unstretch it, you'll probably break oxide. Have you measured conductivity as a function of the number of stretch? Do you see reduction? Yeah, actually, it's, we haven't published this yet, but we've, we've done... Um... We've taken wires and stretched them, and I can't remember the the max. It's something on the order of a hundred thousand, or I think it's less than five hundred thousand, but it's something on that order. And we didn't see any change. Now, uh, you can imagine when you, like you said, when you stretch it, you break the oxide, and then you expose the underlying metal, which means it's going to oxidize. 
And if you did that enough times, I always tell people it's like being inside of a room and putting paint on the wall. If you put enough layers of paint, suddenly you like you feel claustrophobic, right? And you've consumed all your metal. Um, but I think there's two things working in our favor. One is that the oxide is extremely thin. So you would really only see it if you were starting with a very thin wire to begin with. And then secondly, is that I think at some point it starts buckling, um, as, as you probably can imagine. So you stretch out your elastomer, you now have an oxide barrier. And then when you let it go again, it's going to kind of corrugate. And so we've seen evidence of that if we do it um, just on, on an elastomer substrate, you let it go, you can see the corrugations. And actually in a microchannel, you can also see that the surface gets rougher. It's not really proof per se, but I guess the ultimate, the only thing I can really offer is that we don't see changes in resistance over many, many cycles at, you know, 100%, I think the largest strain we did was 300%. But, you know, if you go to 100% strain, you're basically doubling the area every time and we're not seeing changes. But uh, uh, is that possible? It's just uh, your elastomer layer is too thick. You don't have enough oxygen to... Yeah, uh, your I mean, we, time. we did a back of the envelope calculation to figure out how long so you strain it and how long do you have to hold it to make sure that oxygen, it's just basically a monolayer so of oxygen has time to diffuse. Yeah. Because if you did it really, really fast, you would, you could imagine consuming the oxygen that's dissolved in, in the um, in the silicone. But um, yeah, so we we tried to account for that, and of course, these experiments are if you do it a hundred thousand times, that might take like four or five days. <laughs> so it definitely has enough time to diffuse over those length scales. Um, so yeah. Interesting. Uh, Jiaxing, uh, Huang, please. Okay. Um, hi, Michael. Hi. Can you hear me? Hi. Really nice talk. Yeah, I learned quite a lot from this. I um, just have a quick question about uh, the uh, surface oxide formation. Have you or others have tried to introduce a surface capping agent to modulate oxide formation or potentially maybe even hinder oxide formation? Yeah, um, we have to a, a, a small extent, but the, the nice, some really nice work from Chris Tabor's group at the Air Force Research Lab has been looking at that, um, looking at different chemistries. Most of the work that's in the literature is looking at grafting stuff to the oxide itself. So like you have the oxide and then sort of form an additional shell around it to change the chemical functional groups and that kind of thing. Um, and, and in that sense, it's, it's not surprising. Like, you know, there's, it's an oxide, you can do like silane reactions and that kind of thing. But, uh, but you might imagine that if you, let's say you sonicate the metal in, uh, in thiol, thiols yeah. are known to bond to metals very strongly. And there has been some work in that regard um, to use thiols to, to bond to the metal surface. And what people see if you use like XPS or other surface sensitive techniques is that um, the thiols are bonded to the metal, but you also get oxide. So kind of the, the beautiful thing you could imagine is if you have just bare metal and then you've got a bunch of like files okay. sticking on the surface that would create a barrier. As best I know, nobody has um, has, has solved that problem. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a great idea. Thank you for joining the call. I can see you're in your car. <laughs> I, I hope pulled over. <laughs> your family didn't kick you out of your house. <laughs> I have another question from the panelist who doesn't have the microphone. Let me read the question. The panelist is uh, 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 Azadi. Uh, she died from, uh, from uh, Iowa State. The question is, uh, why liquid metal elastomer with dispersed particle are electrically non-conductive? Oh, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a story that the grad students will appreciate. So about four years ago, I did a sabbatical at Microsoft, and uh, it was a chance to for me to become humbled back in the lab and show how difficult it is to do experiments. And I thought I was so smart. I bought some silver powder, and I dumped a bunch of it in a cup with some sil silicone, and I mixed it together, and it looked beautiful. It was like silvery, shiny. And I thought, you know, this is gonna be really conductive. And I took my multimeter and touched it down and there was no conductivity. Um, and so basically there's, there are conductive composites in the literature, but typically 
they, uh, they either have high loadings of filler to ensure that the particles are close enough that they touch, or they do tricks with um, geometry. So for example, if you use nanowires, they'll be more likely to touch than say two particles. So <clears throat> when you mix the liquid metal into the silicone, um, and there's we're not the only people to do this, there's uh, great examples in the literature, but uh, you can go to very high concentrations and you have to be careful if you're reporting volume percent versus weight percent. Um, they're quite different because of the density of the metal, it's about six. Um, but anyway, you can imagine you start mixing these little globs and if they're <clears throat> roughly spherical and there's silicone between them, electrons have to hop many, many times through a, a basically a barrier of silicone and it does not work. Now, there is a cool trick that people have shown and it's called mechanical centering, which uh, is a term that Rebecca Kramer's group at Yale kind of coined. And that is that you take your little imagine liquid metal spheres that are inside of elastomer and you squish it like as hard as you can. And if you do that enough, it will rupture and break the walls and merge together. So there's actually a kind of a cool way you can create these elastomers and push on them and make them conductive. But without doing some trick like that or, or using really big particles at really high loading, those composites are not conductive. And on, on the one hand, that's kind of a bad thing because a lot of people like you know, conductors. But if you want to make a dielectric material or, um, you know, like a really good thermal conductor that's electrically insulating, liquid metals are, are really good because you can, you can put a bunch of liquid in there and it doesn't really change the uh, mechanical properties too much. Thanks for the question. Great, great. Uh, I don't yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you for your lecture, Professor Dickey. Uh, uh, I have one question that uh, uh, one of your slides show that uh, composite, composites made up of uh, liquid mat uh, metal and uh, softer material can achieve both high stress and uh, high strain. And uh, uh, my question is that the liquid metal is liquid. Why is uh, the, why the stiffness uh, on the st uh, stretch is big? Yeah, that's, um, that's, uh... Sorry, that's probably my fault for not explaining it very well. The, the, uh, it is liquid metal when we inject it, but we actually freeze it. So in those experiments that you're referring to, the, the core of that structure is, is solid. Yeah. So it's solid gallium. So it's, it's, it's a soft metal, which I think is important here because it allows us to, to stretch it. Um, but it, it is solid. So w without that, it would be very soft and stretchy. Okay, I see. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, I saw a uh, uh, hand raising from uh, Yongzhu. Uh, how can I find you? Give you the, uh, unmute you. So Yongzhu, can you uh, unmute yourself? Okay, yes, yes, yeah. Hello, Hi. Michael. Hi. <laughs> uh, well, I have heard your talk uh, uh, quite a number of times here and there. I think this one is definitely comprehensive and uh, informative. Well, thanks to YML for being a platform. Uh, even though, well, our buildings are probably just next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I do have a, a question about a, a very impressive talk. Yeah, you were talking about self-healing, right? So you, you literally cut the, cut the liquid metal wire, but then you put it back, it's still conductive, right? But the, as you said, the, quickly, uh, the, uh, a skin layer is formed, right? So when you push back, so what happens is you have a double, well, two skin layers in between, right? So what happens? Well, we know like aluminum, the aluminum oxide will effectively make it uh, insulator. So in this case, what happens? Does it uh, affect the conductivity in any way or the skin is just uh, as conductive as the liquid itself? That's a great question. And I'm smiling because I get asked that a lot and I'm really sad that after all these years, I still don't have a great answer. But I'll, t I'll tell you what we observe um, to give you a little bit of insight. So if you take two droplets of liquid metal and you bring them together very gently and very slowly, you can pull them back apart. So imagine like a snowman, right? You bring it together and you pull the, the head off of the snowman. Um, but if you do anything other than the most gentle touching, it will actually merge together. So then when you pull the snowman apart, it's more like bubble gum. It's like, it's actually merged together. And we've imaged it with high speed camera and you can actually see, instead of just two spheres sitting on each other, it actually 
the the waist of the snowman gets bigger, which means mm. lick, there's a liquid connection between the two. And so my my thinking is that somehow when you touch these things together, um, first of all, it's very thin and fragile. So you break the oxide. And then if the liquid finds itself, it's just going to merge back together. So if you measure the resistance, I mean, yeah, you're going to see a little difference because we don't get the, the interfaces perfectly aligned. But if you pull that interface back apart, it's it's liquid merged together. You can actually see that it's it's got liquid liquid contact. Now, then that raises a question of well, where where the heck does the oxide go? <laughs> you know, is it is it uh, just floating like a little iceberg at the interface, or is it wrinkled up and kind of? You know? And I don't know. I mean, it would be interesting to look at um, like nano CT and look inside and see what's actually happening. Uh, but okay, yeah, at least is the portion it... of it is making metal metal contact, which is kind of a neat difference between this and other solid particles. Okay, great. I think this uh, oxide layer is really magic. Um, <laughs> it really is. is. Is it transparent? Is it any way you can you can look at this process? Is this liquid metal transparent? You can see what happens at the at the at the interface to the skin. Uh, well, it's I mean it's optically transparent, so it's it's. You can think of it kind of like glass. Um, okay. The gallium oxide is a wide band gap semiconductor, so um, yeah, I just I would think of it like like glass. Um, you can see through it, but you know it's just like looking at a piece of aluminum foil. Like, what are you gonna what are you gonna look for? Maybe you can dice it. You can. Yeah. Show some colors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, if you if you cut it, of course, it kind of smears. <laughs> that's that's tricky. Now, you yeah. the way that we've been able to image the oxide is by using small particles, and we're not the only ones to do this. But you just break it into particles, and if it's a particle, and you look through it, you know, kind of from the side, you can see the oxide layer. So we have been able to image it. Um, we've also done some spectroscopy to look at, you know. Use ellipsometry to measure the thickness and measure the chemical composition and all these kinds of things. One of the things I, I didn't mention that's also really cool about it is if you put um, a metal, another metal, into the liquid metal that's more reactive than gallium, so for example aluminum, you can actually change the chemistry of the oxide there. And I think people are only just now beginning to kind of realize that and explore it. It was. I think first shown by some uh, my friends down at uh, RMIT in Australia. That's kind of another kind of cool twist on this. You can change. You're not just limited to gallium oxide. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, not Michael. Oh, thanks a lot. Great question. Good question. Uh, Sulin, uh, Sulin, you have a question. Hi, hey, Michael. Uh, great talk. Uh, yeah. I want to I want to follow up a question from Jigan and also Jimmy. So we recently actually uh, did uh, some work on. Um, liquid metal and elastomo uh, components published in uh, advanced materials, but we haven't just spotted yet. So what we did was to uh, actually uh, made a 3D uh, liquid metal network inside uh, mm -hmm. inside elastomo, rather than use these particles or wires. So it's 3D connected, so they can uh, highly enhance the uh, stretchability, and also as we stretch. We can increase the conductivity. Um, cool. So, um, so uh, get back to uh, uh, a little bit of comment from Chigang's uh, uh, question. So, what do we find that if we uh, stretch back and forth, stretch and non stretch the liquid metal elastomo composites, we find that we build up, build up a lot of, uh, uh, quite a lot of, quite a noticeable um, problem stream. We know elastomo will not give you any uh, permanent strain. We know if the liquid metal itself will not, the only possibility is comes from oxide. Mm. So when you when you stretch, you expose, uh, you, you actually break the, the, the oxide layer mm -hmm. and oxygen for, uh, diffuse in and you will form more oxide layer. We, we can say this is a plastic definition. Well, when you, when you unstretch it, and also the the also like oxide layer also break, okay. So you stretch back and forth, you will accumulate a lot of permanent uh, uh, strain. Mm. Uh, um, uh, so so I think that the conductivity not change much. 
uh, in that sense. Yeah, that could be. That's that's really interesting. And I'm wondering if maybe the higher surface area um, in your kind of in your network of particles that that could make it more pronounced, like some of these effects more pronounced. Because in our case, what I was reporting is just a kind of a simple wire. Um, we were just measuring resistivity. We didn't measure any of the mechanical properties. Exactly. Yeah. We can stretch to up to 600% altogether without breakage. Yeah. Uh, another question that follow up uh, Jimmy's question. Uh, so it's very fanc fascinating that the surface, the surface tension you can manage, you can manage manipulate the surface tension. We found that yes, we found the surface tension uh, is such huge. So you know that for liquid we have surface tension, for solid we not only have surface tension, we have surface stress. Mm -hmm. The surface tension, surface stress could be com compressive. So I probably didn't hear your answer to uh, uh, to Jimmy's question. When you do this uh, manipulation, the source stress, the source, the source stress could be compressive at some point. Mm -hmm. That's what that's what I think. Yeah. So if you measure the the tension versus potential, um, and this is over a small range from zero to like one volt that you're applying. Um, at some point you start depositing oxide and the tension drops and it, it actually the shape looks somewhat like you would expect from a surfactant. But when we start getting so-called dielectric breakdown, so, so imagine you have your oxide, right? And on this side you have metal and then this side you have electrolyte and you're applying a voltage. Now it's not much, but when you think about the electric field, it's a big, pretty big electric field over here. So on this side you want gallium is forming, you know, some gallium three plus or something like that. And over here you have negative ions and they want to combine. So when the field is big enough, you can actually drive ions. And if I turn my hand this way, you can actually drive ions through the oxide layer. I don't know that that is necessarily the source of the stress, but that is exactly where we start seeing um, a different behavior in terms of the surface tension versus potential. And it just continues to drop as you drive more and more um, more and more breakdown of that oxide layer. But the interesting thing is it doesn't get thicker until you get to really kind of higher potentials. And I think what's happening is you're, when you deposit the oxide, you're constantly dissolving it. So, um, so even though it's a solid shell, it's, and this is really why it's been so complicated to study, you form a, a solid like shell, um, which can have stresses in it, but you're also constantly dissolving it and reforming it. And so it's a dynamic surface. I must say it's like it's like a brick wall where you could take a brick off and move a brick, and then you know. Um, and so, I'm kind of dancing around your question because I don't have. <laughs> we're still trying to figure this out, but um, but you're absolutely right that there could be some compressive stresses, and I think the best evidence for that there's actually been some work in the literature on aluminum, where um, the authors took a cantilever with aluminum. And remember aluminum and gallium are very similar in their oxide layers. <clears throat> and they applied a voltage. And if you found tensile stress, the cantilever should bend up. And if it's compressive stress, it should bend down. And they found that the cantilever bent down and they could calculate from the cantilever how much compressive stress was formed. And it was more than enough to overcome the interfacial tension of the liquid. So the way I've been thinking about it, and I'm, I'm really presenting this in a very modest way to this community because you know there is a mechanics component to it that we just don't understand yet, but you've got a liquid which is under tension. That tension is lowered due to the presence of stuff on the surface. But in addition to that, there's some compressive stress that is likely pushing outwards. That is when you add that, those two things together is effectively zero at some point. Uh, yes, uh, so um, yeah, we know that for the mechanics community, we know that if you have very soft matter, like a liquid, we have soft tension. If you have very stiff material, like, like, like a, like a um, diamond on the surface, the stress is definitely compressive. Mm -hmm. Right. So there is a transition. So if you can see this transition in your liquid metal, that's, that's, uh, that's actually wonderful. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, send, the, send the paper to you and then I, I, I'll follow up with these questions. I'm very interested in this. Yeah. I think I either saw your, you or one of your colleagues presented at SES last year. Um, maybe. I'm, 
Yeah, I, is that memory, but I, th I remember seeing it and thinking it was really nice work. So yeah, yeah. I'd love to see it again. Thank you. Yeah. Great discussion. Next question is from uh, uh, Li Huaqing. Uh, Li Hua, can you unmute your microphone? Hey, Michael, nice talk. Uh, I have three questions. Uh, so first of all, uh, although liquid metals are not toxic, uh, they are very corrosive. Uh, if there's any leakage of that, it, is that a concern? Uh, the second question uh, is about uh, the surface tension. Yeah, I don't know whether I miss it. Uh, my question is, so why the oxidation layer actually decrease? Uh, oh, so you, okay, so you, you mentioned that that's because like surface stress and the surface tension. Okay, yeah, maybe uh, that's a real. Uh, the third question uh, is about, uh, uh, you had a uh, video showing that you hand a weight, but it takes quite a long time for it to elongate. So uh, what's the time scale uh, behind that? What is causing the time scale? Thank you for the questions. Are you at Stanford? Um, no, uh, I'm at UCI. Yeah, that oh, might okay, okay. I, yeah, I didn't recognize the background. That's very nice. Oh, thank Thanks. you. Thank you for joining so early in the morning. I appreciate it. Um, so the first question, if I remember, was about the corrosivity. And yeah. you know, there, there's there's several issues with liquid metal, and I probably should just be more upfront about this in the talk. So one is cost. So gallium is is more expensive than the most metals. It's about a dollar a gram. So on these like small length scales and the studies we're doing, it's you know, it's certainly not prohibitively expensive, but you know, it would never make sense to make like power lines out of liquid metal, It'd just be too expensive. <clears throat> but another one that's a concern is the, uh, what you called corrosivity. And I've kind of gone back and forth as to whether that's the right word for it, uh, because corrosion to me usually implies oxidation like rust. But what you're referring to, just so everybody knows, um, is that liquid metals, and it's not just gallium, any liquid metal would do it. Uh, it's just gallium <laughs> happens to be one of the few ones that is liquid at room temperature. But anyway, liquid metals can attack um, other metals in some ways that's very destructive. So in the case of kind of the best example is aluminum, it will attack the grain boundaries of aluminum and then brittle it, make it very weak. And so that that is, is potentially problematic. Uh, but one of the, the interesting things um, to note is that certain metals and um, copper being one, does not seem to be affected by it. And um, we've I'm part, I'm been working with uh, Tori Miller, who's a metallurgist at University of Florida, uh, to kind of do a literature survey. And it's very interesting. There's so many factors that go into this embrittlement uh, process, you know, depending on the grain size, the, the uh, metal composition, um, the, you know, the temperature, the way it was prepared, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, we have just completed a, a, a little bit of a study um, on uh, looking at gallium and copper. And what we find is that the gallium and copper form a, an intermetallic at the interface. And I don't remember, it's like copper gallium two or something like that. And uh, we've looked at it over time and with temperature and it, you know, it gets a little bit thicker, but Basically, it's, it's similar to the oxide in the sense that it seems to form a very good barrier, diffusion barrier. So for applications, um, you either need something like that where your liquid metal, metal contacts either form, naturally form some kind of barrier, or you intentionally add something, which there's some, several examples in the literature of people adding graphene or other carbonaceous materials. And the beauty of that is the graphene is conductive, but it's a barrier to the, the metal. So that's the other option is just say, well, okay, let's, let's just not even get metal metal contact. Um, and so those are, those are the solutions. I still have a little bit of worry that, you know, if somebody um, had one of these devices and the metal leaks, like, you know, what happens? Okay. It's not toxic, but what if kids got it on their hand and that kind of stuff? So, I mean, I think either, these are real considerations, but you know, for many years, we've had light bulbs that had mercury vapor in them, and those are much easier to break and expose mercury vapor. So I think if you have the right, um, the right design and the right encapsulation strategies and stuff that it could work. You know, you imagine like the hinge of a computer or something that's never going to be broken open, uh, typically. Um, moving on to the second question, you were asking about the surface tension. I think the short answer is uh, even though we've studied it for a long time, 
and we know a lot more than I'm telling you. Um, it's we really don't completely have our arms wrapped around it. And I just to kind of summarize, we think that it's some combination of the oxide acting like a surfactant. So presenting a new chemical species at that interface. And then number two is that there's some stress in that film. And what's causing that stress? Not clear, but it's probably some electrochemical process. And then I think your third question was about the mechanical it's behavior. Um, and uh, it's actually <laughs> very insightful because one of the things that we found, and, and to be fair, I don't think we did a very as rigorous of a mechanical characterization as somebody in the mechanics community would, would normally do. Um, but, uh, but when we dropped that weight with just the rubber, the, the elastomer, it just the thing fell immediately. But when we had the, the solid core, it fell slower. And so initially as it's falling, that weight is, uh, is straining the metal. And so it's actually quite stiff. And then once that thing starts breaking, then it starts moving faster. Um, but I suspect that there is a strain dependence because um, if you strain it too fast, for example, and the metal breaks, you can imagine the stress concentrating just at that, the bridge between those, those breaks. And then, um, and then the whole thing might fail. So that's, it's potentially a, a problem with that approach. Does that make sense? You look it's time to break. Uh, so if you if you strain the wire very slowly, um, I'm doing a bad job explaining it. If you do it, if you stretch the wire slowly, um, basically the metal will get longer and longer, and then at some point the metal will break. Now you can imagine it, when that thing breaks, you've got a, a shell that surrounds it that's made out of elastomer. If the elastomer doesn't slide along that metal core, um, then your strain goes to infinity right here because your initial length is zero. Imagine I have polymer surrounding my fingers and I pull. If the polymer doesn't slide along my finger, the strain between this narrow, narrow gap will be infinity. And so I believe that, that that process, there's some weird interplay where the, the polymer is sliding and as it slides, it grips more and more and then it breaks again and it keeps repeating itself. I guess uh, the last question was, what controls the rate? Because you have a dead weight, right? You oh, you have a fixed rate. force. Mm. Oh, oh, okay, yes, good question. So, yes. <laughs> so if we... So we did all of our all of our measurements in that experiment and that paper were strain controlled. If you just do stress controlled, where you put um, a heavier mass, if it's too heavy, it will just fall and break. Um, and if you do too light of a mass, it's not heavy enough to to induce that um, mechanism. So we saw our best results when we did strain controlled um, breaking. That's like super insightful question. I'm really glad you asked. All right, great discussion. So uh, we have a question from uh, Dong, Dong, Lei, Dong Lei Fan. Hi, very nice talk, Michael. I really uh, enjoy it. Yeah, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, for, um, um, first is, uh, has anybody measured the viscosity of the liquid metal? And how does it compare with water? Yeah, so you may you may have logged on. I had that like on my second slide, or maybe I went over it too fast. But it's yeah, it's it's close to water. Um, I think it's if you you find the literature value, it's literally twice that of water. So if water is one, this is like one point nine nine. Um, and I I haven't done an exhaustive search, but I believe most liquid metals are the same way. They have tend to have low viscosity, not a huge dependency on temperature. So I I would to a first order approximation think of it like water. Okay, so um, how fast can the outside layer be formed? And uh, well, it depends on the surrounding. Has anybody studied it? And uh, can the oxide layer be made on purpose to mirror all kinds of properties of it? Yeah, so, so in terms of the rate, um, kind of a back of the envelope calculation uh, suggests it's like microseconds. Okay. 
And um, in our 3D printing video, we actually do a burst of pressure and shoot out a jet of the metal and it oxidizes in midair and, and holds its shape. So we know that it's very, very rapid. Now, in principle, like you, you hinted at, you could change the composition of the surrounding environment. Mm -hmm. And you could maybe, for example, lower the oxygen concentration. Yeah. Uh, there was some nice work a few years ago out of UCLA that looked at the interfacial behavior as a function of oxygen composition. And to avoid the oxide forming, remember the oxide's only like a little more than a monolayer, so it doesn't take very much. So to avoid that forming, you had to be below um, parts per million, I think, of oxygen. Um, and so people, a lot of times will tell me like, oh, why don't you do your experiment in like nitrogen? I'm like, well, that's that sounds great, but do you have a, a regular glove box is not good enough. And in fact, my, uh, my friends at Air Force Research Lab bought a glove box to do those types of experiments. And they're telling me that even when they go to every length to remove the oxygen, that oxide layer still forms. Okay. So you might, if you have a really good like argon environment or something like that, and you take every precaution, you might be able to avoid the oxide for like 10 minutes or something like that. <laughs> um, so it's difficult to do. And so kind of the way we've gotten around that is by working in either acid or base and it's not just other people do it as well and that will dissolve off the oxide so but then you know you're working in electrolyte and so that changes things um i don't know if i've answered yeah. your question but i see have you thought about dispersing uh, liquid metal in oil that 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 oxygen can be removed and how it may behave uh I mean, the short answer is, guess is no, I haven't, <laughs> yeah. we haven't done it for sure, uh, as far as I know. Um, you know, oxygen can still dissolve in oil, right? So you would have, you would still have to deoxygenate yeah. the oil. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to think if oil somehow would be better than the experiments that we have done, which is in organic solvents, like we've done um, THF, toluene, ethanol, water, DMF, blah, 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 blah. Um, and in that case, you know, you, <laughs> it's just really difficult to remove oxygen. So, um, okay, so. we just, we don't, yeah. mm -hmm. frankly, everything that we've done, everything I showed, we want the oxide to be there. So I've never had a really compelling reason other than just to answer real basic questions, like to go, mm -hmm. to go to some exotic environment where it was going to be removed. But my feeling is that if you remove the oxide, it's, just going to behave like a high surface tension liquid. And so, yeah. I mean, it could be interesting for certain applications. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Uh, another question from uh, uh, Chi, Chi Bing Pei. Yes. Uh, good morning. Hey, Michael. Hi. No hard questions, please. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of hard. Right? Practical questions. <laughs> nice work. Beautiful. Uh, so, you didn't say much about using this uh, liquid metal for dual heating. So for your electric chromic displays, you, you, you I mean, basically it's a, a dual heating. The liquid metal is a dual heater there, right? Mm -hmm. So how thin this uh, metal line can be made? Hmm. Well, um, first of all, just yeah, thank you for joining. I know it's early in the morning for you. Thank you for the nice, nice words. Um, you know, one of the problems that we had with the liquid metal in that work was that it was too conductive. You know, for dual heating, there's kind of like a sweet yeah. spot. Um, yeah. I forget, like toaster ovens used nichrome, which I think is like, you know, it's conductive, but it's not that conductive because you want to have some resistance for electrons to flow through the metal. And so um, in the work that we did, we, um, just because of the way we fabricated it, we used micro channels. We used them, they were 50 microns tall, and then we varied the width to control the resistivity or the resistance, excuse me, um, to figure out how, and, and it just behaved like a normal joule heater that you would expect. Um, what is it, I squared R behavior? Um, yeah. So that wasn't surprising, but to get, to get kind of to the more um, nuanced question, part of your question, which was the last thing, um, how thin can you go? Um, I, it's tricky. There's, there's one, one or two papers in the literature that claim that you can get galene, you know, mm -hmm. so graphene, but instead of ca carbon, you use 
gallium. And um, well, I find that to be very interesting knowing how reactive gallium is, that how could you make a single layer of, gall of gallium? Um, but, uh, but anyway, there's been people that have shown like if you kind of make, <coughs> excuse me, make it really, really thin, there's still some conductivity. And I think there's probably some like remnant liquid metal that you just can't completely get rid of. Uh, but anyway, that would be to the very extreme as having just a few layers of, of, uh, of atoms. If you wanted something that was more wire-like, um, you know, people have injected liquid metal into really small tubes, like 100 nanometer tubes, and made wires mm -hmm. that are very small. Um, it's not super practical because it requires a lot of pressure, and I don't know how you would do it um, in a real device, but... The point is people have made liquid metal structures very small. In fact, there's a science paper that they made a liquid metal thermometer where they somehow sprinkled in gallium. I mean, this is really black magic, but they sprinkled in gallium with carbon when they formed carbon nanotubes. And when they took the stuff out, the liquid metal was inside the nanotube. <laughs> and so they called it a nanothermometer. Yeah. They don't know how it got in there. And I mean, I don't know how you would, but the point is like, you can make really small structures, but um, in our lab, it's just, you know, if you're going to make a micro channel or something like that, it's, it's typically like tens of microns or something like that. Yeah. I might be dancing around the essence of your question, but I, I hope that. Yeah, that sort of. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. I mean, it's, so I guess the people have not done much uh, uh, using it as a dual heating electrode. Right. Yeah. I, no, there hasn't been too much. Um, I think maybe one or two papers. Okay. A side question. So you mentioned that the Ghanaian's price is about a dollar per gram. Mm -hmm. Is that because of abundancy or is it because nobody uses it? That's a great question. <laughs> so, so gallium is really, it's very interesting. It's, it's a good lesson in economics. It's actually as abundant in the earth as lead to a first approximation. And oh, lead okay. is, means an exotic or expensive material. Um, the reason it's expensive is that it's not mineable, meaning you cannot stick a shovel in the ground and dig it out. So the way that people get gallium is as an impurity in alumina. So, you know, if you want to make an aluminum can, you need to go find alumina in the ground, which is oxidized yeah. aluminum, reduce it somehow to form the metal. And while you're doing that process, an imp sort of an impurity that comes out is gallium. And so luckily, you know, we use a lot of aluminum in our society. And so there is gallium is available and they don't have to have a separate mining process. It's just a, it's kind of an, a byproduct of forming aluminum. Um, so it's, yeah, it's just, it's just the fact that it's, it's difficult to, to get it uh, straight from the ground because it's kind of dispersed in a bunch of other oxides. Yeah, our lab is like the Fort, Fort Knox of uh, gallium, <laughs> if you know what Fort, <laughs> Fort Knox is. <laughs> Thank you. Sure, Great. thanks. Thanks. So, Michael, if you recall, back to a few years ago, we were working on a proposal. We were thinking about uh, the grow antenna concept using liquid metal. It, it is amazing to see you already <laughs> are growing part of the, and the, the liquid metal. So, in the experiment you show, you can, for a pre-patent uh, microfluidic channel, you can retract the trace by following a particular path, that you have to conduct your path. But for growing, you have to have, a, already have a path to grow, right? So can you grow on demand for a particular pattern? Um, well, um, I guess yes, but maybe not in the way you're not as elegant as what you're imagining. Um, you one way to get the metal to go kind of into a channel is mm -hmm. to lower its surface tension at the leading edge, right. so that the higher tension on the back kind of pushes it in to get a, an imbalance in Laplace pressure. Mm -hmm. So people, including ourselves, have used that to move like imagine like a slug of liquid metal that's you can move back and forth or you can get it from some reservoir to inject in and come back like that and so yeah you yeah you can do that um another way people have done this is by trying to make the the walls non-stick to the oxide because one of the stuff sticks to almost yeah. everything and so you can, if you can do that then you can push it in by pneumatics pump it in and, and pull it back out um 
I think kind of what you're the science fiction vision here would be like somehow like the metal just kind of appears and then you, you make it disappear. And I mean, perhaps you could do that electrochemically, but it might, it would be very slow. Um, I don't know. There might be some other ways I'm not thinking of at the moment, but yeah. So, I mean, when I first started on this, I, that was the thing I, I was sort of most excited about. Like, how do you move? You've got a liquid, you can move it. What's the best way to do it? And in, in some ways the oxide is a nuisance in that context, because if you, inject the liquid metal into a straw or into a tube, you can't really pull it back out very easily without leaving a big mess. Maybe underneath the channel, you have a particular patent counter electrode. You apply a voltage at that location, you can draw the liquid metal follow, following by following a particular path. Yep. So you, you modify the oxide by on demand at a particular location. Yep. Yeah, that would be really cool. Great, great, really great work. Thank you. So uh, do we have other questions? Just a couple. Thank you for being so patient, everybody. Oh, I have a, a question by this audience, but I think uh, this audience has left. Uh, On my screen, I can see there's a Is a Marquis still here? Uh, the question was asked. Uh, on the uh, Q&A chat box. So the question was, uh, for the ultra salt dielectric, why liquid metal? Why not solid particles? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, so if you, so one way that you can increase the dielectric of, of a material like silicone, for example, is to dump in a bunch of carbon or, um, or other solid particles that can increase the dielectric constant. And that does work. The downside is that if you start putting in more solid particles, it becomes less elastomer-like. Um, in other words, the material becomes stiffer um, and doesn't have the nice soft properties. And so what we were trying to do was make a, a soft material that when you push it, it gets the maximum change in capacitance for the smallest touch possible. Because if you think about it, your skin, you don't have to push your skin very hard to, to sense touch. You can just gently touch. You can actually just you know blow on your skin. Your skin can feel it. So there's interest in trying to make sensors that are uh, very sensitive to, to touch. And we kind of came at it from two ways. We wanted to increase the dielectric constant while also making the material softer. And usually those two things are at conflict with one another. If you make it if you raise the dielectric constant, you typically make the material stiffer. And so that was the nice thing about the liquid metal. And then in the end, to me, um, the most interesting part was that we got the dielectric constant not only to increase, which is not surprising because it's a foam, but it actually decreased. And I don't know of any other material, composite or otherwise, that does that, not in such a dramatic way. And you know, why does that matter? Well, think about a capacitor. If you start squishing it, you increase the capacitance because you uh, bring the electrodes closer together. But if you can simultaneously decrease the dielectric, you can make the total capacitance not change when you do this. Now, we didn't do that, <laughs> and, we're, and it's, I'm just speculating, but um, that's one reason why that could be exciting is some soft capacitor that just never changes capacitance when you deform it because the two things offset each other. Great. Uh, we got a question from uh, Jason, Jason Stack. Please. Thank you, Jason. You're so patient. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm a PhD student with Drugong at Harvard. Um, and thank you for the I've talk. heard of that guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, I had a couple questions. So uh, first, uh, you mentioned the issues with uh, silicone elastomers that you're using for the wire in essentially because they're not tough. They can uh, rupture easily. But um, a lot of these uh, techniques for increasing the toughness have um, a high hysteresis. Mm. Uh, they dissipate a lot of energy, but they can do this one cycle and then it uh, changes afterward. Um, I, I see that being a big barrier if we're using these materials in an application such as a stretchable wire, because that's the 
the main property you're trying to get out of the wire is that it, you can stretch it many times and it doesn't change as you use it. Um, I guess I don't really have a, a good solution, um, uh, but d do you see this being a, a big barrier um, to what yeah. you're trying to achieve with this? Well, I should, I should let your advisor answer the question because it's a little intimidating trying to answer this. Um, but uh, yeah, I think, I mean, two things come to mind. Number one is you're, you're talking about the approach of using tough materials as an encapsulating layer. And of course, when you stretch them, you dissipate energy, but then it takes a while for them to come back. Um, with the tough wires that I showed, just I didn't mention this, but it's basically an elastomeric shell. So as soon as you let go, it goes back. So that's there's some there's definitely some downsides of the approach that I showed. Um, but one nice thing is it will come back very quickly. And unfortunately, though, you'd have to melt the gallium and re-solidify it. So you, it goes back faster, but to regain the original properties, you still got to jump through some hoops. Now, I thought, I thought it would be really cool if you use magnetic materials instead of the, the gallium, because then when it comes back, it, it automatically goes back together. But that doesn't really get to the heart of your question, which is just in general, if you took one of these materials that you guys are developing that are really beautiful and tough, um, how do you get them to come back faster? And I mean, this is just off the top of my head, but you know, one neat thing about having the liquid metal there is that you could actually um, do jewel heating as uh, we talked about earlier, which would speed up that recovery process. Um, it's not very elegant, but it's kind of cool because it allows you to retain your mechanical properties while recovering faster. So maybe for, mm -hmm. maybe not for like headphone wires, maybe that's not the best way to do it, but uh, maybe there's some application where you would you could live with that trade-off um but otherwise i don't know i um i pose it to you i think that should be part of your phd <laughs> yeah, michael uh, so maybe i inject a little bit uh jason is not working on uh the following thing but he, he probably knows something uh, recently in recent two years we have developed material has uh, two properties that people really want one is tough and the other is actually elastic. You can make elastic material and tough. So one uh, simple way we demonstrated, a number of ways you do this. A simple way is uh, uh, you, let's say you use your PDMS, right? You can make PDMS toughness 10 times or, or, or 100 times tougher than PDMS you have. Uh, all we did was uh, uh, make PDMS, a, a stiffer PDMS fiber, embedded in soft PDMS matrix, that mm. material is tough and it's elastic. It's so your, that's your PNAS paper? Right. Yeah, okay, so yeah. Then we have uh, developed uh, uh, similar strategies. They're uh, even more uh, elegant strategies, essentially achieve high toughness without his razor. You measure his razor, it's almost zero. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's a serious advance in recent years. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. Awesome. I'll send you papers. Hopefully, you can update. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've seen, um, I've seen one of them, but I, yeah, that, that's yeah. great. Yeah, that's a great question. I had uh, one other comment. Um, okay. So, um, you, the the last part of your talk, where you uh, showed the great um, change in surface tension with a uh, voltage. Um, it was very interesting. I was wondering if, I imagine this would work for any uh, liquid metal that has some uh, electrochemical oxidation process. Have you demonstrated it with other liquid metals? Um, and then second, if you're using like this uh, liquid metal to 3D print these uh, the circuits, could there be any interactions here? You're applying a voltage to a liquid metal and you could cause it to uh, change its uh, shape as you showed in the last uh, like few videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are, those are two good questions. So for this kind of the second one first, um, so it's not just applying a voltage and, and I know you, you, you know this, but if you gotta apply the voltage, but it's also gotta be an electrolyte because you, you need to have an environment to close, complete this, the circuit so that you can actually have electrochemical reactions. So you could imagine doing it in electrolyte, you could imagine maybe doing it in, um, in gel or something like that, um, and maybe making some kind of like dynamic structure. So I, I 
think that's possible. Um, one of the tricky things is if as soon as the oxide goes away, the metal goes back to a high a, a high state of tension. So you know, wanting to beat up. So you'd have to kind of uh, account for that. But um, to your first question, it's it's a really good one and um, and very insightful as well. And something I, I almost never mention when I give talks just because I don't think about it, but we did like maybe one day's worth of experiments with mercury because my students were scared of it. <laughs> and um, and I understand, I don't want them to, you know, um, put their health at risk, but, uh, but we tried it with mercury and all that happened was black stuff formed on the surface of mercury. And I think that this gets back to the mechanism, which I think is there's some stress in the oxide. Mercury does not form some nice passivating oxide that's like a solid shell. So when we started um, doing the electrochemical oxidation, in other words, converting mercury into some mercury salt, we just form gunk on the surface. And so I, um, it's not direct proof by any means, and I wish we could have explored it more um, you know, if mercury didn't have the toxicity issues, it'd be really interesting. Um, but, but anyway, the, the, the point is that I, I think a key part of the gallium is it does form this like conformal shell and that somehow when that thing starts breaking down and stuff starts getting pushed through it, it, it creates compressive stresses that you just don't see on mercury. Um, before the COVID thing, um, one of my students was going to try this with Fields Metal, which is a it's not a liquid at room temperature, but it's at, I think it melts at like 60 degrees. And so it's experimentally accessible. And as far as I know, we didn't do the experiment. So um, maybe someone can rush off and do that and <laughs> do it and try. Uh, Otherwise, it's like you, you're talking about indium and tin, which are above the boiling point of water. So it's, yeah, tricky. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jason. Another question came from uh, Siket. Maria. Hi, bro. Uh, can you listen? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay. You must be really Hi, tired. Bro. <laughs> no, no, bro. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, thank you, bro, for such an interesting talk. Uh, I'm a PhD student from NTU Singapore. Uh, I have one question, uh, very different questions regarding the application part. Can we apply this uh, liquid metal to enhance the surface of the additive manufactured uh, metallic components? in terms of their surface finish, like RA values and AC values. Can you decrease that by applying the liquid metals? Yeah, yeah, pe people have done that. I don't know that they've done it with gallium, but there is an approach to 3D printing that uses metal powder, solid metal powder, and fuses it together. And of course, when you fuse the powder, um, if you don't do it the right way, you can get a lot of pores. So it's kind of like a, like a sponge. And so one of the techniques that people have used in the past is to take that solid piece of metal that has a bunch of pores in it and then dip it into some liquid metal that will infuse and by capillary action go into those pores. Now I'm talking about truly molten metals. Uh, I don't remember what, what's commonly used, but it's you know maybe aluminum. I think aluminum melts at like 600 or so. Um, I don't know that people have used gallium and this kind of gets back to one of the earlier questions that if you, you know, one of the downsides of gallium is it can actually embrittle certain metals. So you'd have to be very wise about the combinations of metals that you use so that you, you know, you might improve the surface finish, but you might yes. make the part weaker. Yeah. So that would have to be something you would consider. Um, yeah, uh, okay, okay, bro. Uh, one more question. Uh, you talked about the particle synthesis in your slides. Uh, there are three processes for that. So does it apply to all the all the liquid metals or it will be different for different metals? Yep, as far as I know, all of them. I mean, if you did mercury, then you would have to put some capping agent on the metal. Uh, but yeah, it, as far as I know, I mean, and it's, it's so easy that I can do it. I mean, literally <laughs> I could go in the lab right now and do it. You just take the metal and you, and you just stir it. <laughs> Very good, okay, I understand, bro. Yeah, yeah. and I mean- I'm really new to this uh, area. That's why I just asked this question. Yeah, so yeah, okay. it's really, you know, imagine like salad dressing or something, you know, you just stir it. Yeah. Uh, of course, I, the, the downside is depending on how crudely you do it, you have poor control over the distribution of particle sizes. So mm -hmm. that's where it gets a little, a little bit tougher is that there's some tricks that people have done to make the, 
the polydispersity, the, the distribution of particle diameter smaller. Okay. Um, but if you just want to make particles, you could just take silicone, liquid metal, and just take a knife and stir it up. Okay, okay. Um, okay. It won't look, we all take a little while, <laughs> but you can do it. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, I am just applying uh, the, the same thing of the liquid metal. I'm thinking of applying the liquid metal to process the surface finish of the already manufactured metallic components. Uh, so I think uh, from your slides it is a great learning for me. I try to apply to this in the same. Yeah. Great. Well, uh, I hope and thanks to Professor Jimmy also because he already sent the invitation to us. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Great. Great. Uh, Tung, uh, you have a question. Oh yeah, sure. Um, hey, Michael. Uh, great talk. Thank you. So uh, previously, uh, I, I believe she being asked a question that how thin you can make this wire. Uh, my question is actually going to the opposite direction. So uh, have you tried, uh, is it possible that they really spread the liquid metal on the surface of a large area on the surface of a substrate? Mm -hmm. Now, if you can uh, do that, like the, the map, you in your background, right? So the somewhat showing large area. If you can do a blanket of this thin layer of the liquid metal, then you expose it to air. So immediately then on the surface will, will form this very thin layer of uh, oxidation layer. Mm -hmm. Now, in that case, if you start to deform the substrate, what will happen? Is that a similar to the the, the tough uh, wire you showed or something different? Yeah, so I mean, for the tough wire, it had to be solid. So as, as long as it's liquid, it will stretch. And as you stretch it, you've, you're gonna break the oxide. So that the oxide breaks at like, I forget the exact number, but let's just say it's like 5% strain. Um, so it's it doesn't take a whole lot of um, of deformation to get the oxide to break, but then of course if it's exposed to air, it will re-break. So you kind of imagine like this, like it breaks, and then the underlying material will will re-oxidize and continue to break. Um, we'd we'd started talking a little bit about this before the the talk, and um, I don't remember what you heard and, and didn't, but just for the sake of everybody, um, the oxide does form essentially instantly, you know, within microseconds. However, I don't think it reaches its it's equilibrium, or I should say maybe steady state um, thickness until for some time, um, minutes, hours, something like that. So you can imagine if you start stretching this thing and it breaks right here, it's gonna continue to break in that spot because it's thinner and weaker at that spot. Um, now, you, to your question, you, you can certainly spread it. Um, it's a little bit funky when you spread it. It's um, if you if you take a droplet and uh, you know a droplet is going to be spherical and if you keep making that droplet bigger and bigger at some point you reach so-called capillary length where gravitational forces are enough to overcome the interfacial forces and that capillary length is i believe one to two millimeters or so uh, which is similar to water so in a sense think about like water you can make a droplet but as soon as the puddle gets big enough it starts spreading but unlike water or maybe maybe there's similar to water, I guess, but um, it will go wherever it will go through the path of least resistance. So if the oxide breaks in one place, it will continue to spread in that direction. So if you try to, for example, spin coat the liquid metal, which is just I just mean take a droplet and spin it really fast, it will spread a little bit and then shoot out on one side, so it won't spread evenly because it's so low viscosity. Um, so in order to make a film. We do, we take like a draw rod, like just a, let's say like a piece of glass and just like scrape back and forth. Or you can use a roller. You can roll it like a rolling pin, roll it back and forth. And all you're doing when you do that is you're essentially pushing the metal coated with oxide against the substrate and that's how it sticks. Without the oxide, it, it doesn't stick to surfaces, but with it, it sticks to almost every surface. It's got really interesting wetting properties, actually. That's a whole other topic. Um, it's funny because people in the literature report contact angles and stuff for this material, and it doesn't make any sense to use a conventional contact angle. You know, 
because it's got a solid on its surface. It can adopt a shape that minimizes surface energy. I'm sorry, Thank is that, you. Did that answer your question? <laughs> sorry to meander there, sorry. Uh, Zhigang, please. So, uh, now, uh, can you also use um, liquid metal as a solvent to develop uh, a gel? The polymer, make, polymer network swollen with uh, liquid metal, is that possible? That's a really interesting idea. So what I described today was putting liquid metal droplets inside of a gel, like hydrogel or elastomer or something like that. Um, but in principle, you could imagine trying to invert that where the liquid metal was the continuous phase and the gel or whatever is uh, on the inside of the metal. Now, uh, it's a little bit difficult to do because the cohesive energy of the liquid metal, the, basically the surface tension of the liquid metal is so high that if you try to push something in, it does not want to go in there, especially carbonaceous materials. Mm -hmm. The trick that I've seen is, and I think it kind of works, is because of the oxide, when you start pushing stuff in, the oxide kind of wraps around mm -hmm. the particle. And so it kind of creates like a wrapping paper around your material that you're trying to get to go in. So if you stir, if you stir the material long enough, you can get stuff to go in. And there's just now starting to be some papers showing where you can get like particles and stuff to go inside the liquid metal. Mm -hmm. um, what I think would be really difficult is um, the idea of having like a sponge gel type material and then getting the liquid metal to flow into every nook and cranny because of its interfacial tension. Um, now you might say, well, why don't you just use the trick of lowering the tension? Uh, but it's tricky because um, even though the tension, first of all, you need electrochemistry. So it's got to, you've got to have that set up. But number two, even though we've lowered the tension, there's still stuff on the surface. And you know, if, if surface tension of a liquid was zero, I would argue, and I think people would argue, the liquid should just break up into a bunch of little droplets. But you could see in our videos that the metal kind of started forming fractals and stuff. And so there's still some kind of like mechanical stuff on the surface. And I think that would make it really difficult to flow into really small pores. Um, people have shown just actually just recently uh, that you can take a piece of paper, put liquid metal on top, and under no circumstances would you ever expect the liquid metal to go through a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. just there's the tension is way too high but when they apply that voltage and lower the tension gravity was actually enough to get it to go through the pores and it started like coming out the other side so i shouldn't be so dismissive but those are kind of like larger pores and i'm thinking if i'm imagining what you're saying it's more like on the molecular scale yeah, on the molecular uh, for example uh, so essentially you are saying there is no good word for it. You are trying to describe a hydrophobic polymer. Yeah. You cannot make a hydrogel out of a hydrophobic polymer, right? Yeah, so, and you want it to be metallic. So how about, how about uh, you, you already, you mentioned this uh, phenomenon. I think this is a standard experiment in metallurgy. It's uh, called uh, embrittlement. You have a gallium can embrittle aluminum. Yep. So gallium evidently love aluminum. Mm -hmm. oh, is that possible if you have a, your polymer chain, side chain, you have some aluminum around it? Is that possible against any physics at all? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I'm smiling because it's, it's an idea that me and um, a colleague here had kicked around. It was like, could you somehow play like tricks in the chemistry yep. to get the liquid metal to sort of like the polymer? And I mean, the best thing I can think of would be a thiol because they bind so well to... Wow. But I think that if you, there's like these metallo, metallo polymers that have metals, but I think they're in, actually in the oxidized state, mm -hmm. which okay. I think changes things because what makes metal so nice is that you get these metal metal bonds where they share electrons and stuff and they just form so-called cold welding. You just bring two pieces of clean metal, stick them together and they, they like each other. Um, but I think as soon as you make that into an oxide, like a um, oxidized state, I don't think that it works, but I don't really know why. 
Maybe there's some obvious reasons. Also, you, you see why I'm asking this. This will be oh, yeah. a stretchable conductor, right? Yep. It's, it's a molecular level. Yep. So, yeah, no fatigue to talk about. Yeah, it would be amazing. <laughs> It'd be really interesting. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Kyung. Uh, another question from uh, Li Qing Jiao. Li Qing, uh, you there? Yes. Yeah. Please go ahead. Oh, hi, you're so patient. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. And we, you know, all of us uh, really enjoy it. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, actually, I, I, before I have two questions, actually one of the questions have already addressed. And the, sec the second question is about the stretching mechanisms. So you mentioned that the, the experiment, uh, you know, met by your student who went to the Stanford, then now is studying the PhD in Stanford, mm -hmm. your private student. Then you mentioned that the, the, the you know, when you stretching the, the steam, the string, you know, the long string that you found is a, it's kind of a cracking segments and segments, not the only one crack, actually several cracks. Yep. So I just wondering, so you, you use two materials here. You use the main one that use the li uh, liquid material metal inside then to make this kind of a phenomena or you, you, you think you, you, you just only use one material, you can get this kind of phenomena. And uh, what kind of, uh, you know, a factor, the main factor could control this behavior. And uh, could we see this, this factor, you know, this factor effect from the string stress curve or other kind of uh, mechanical, uh, you know, feature to show this is the main factor to make this kind of phenomenon. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks for tuning in and for being so patient. Um, your questions are <laughs> really, insight really insightful and really, really good. Um, I didn't explain that mechanism all that well, uh, partly because we don't understand everything about it, that's for sure. Um, but I, I can tell you what, what we do know. Um, First, I would just say that we happened to get very lucky because we had some tubing in our lab. We put in the gallium and we froze it. And when we pulled it, it kind of like worked the first time, which just means that we happen to have materials with the right mechanical properties and the right geometry. So just conceptually, you can imagine that if you took a, a wire with a diameter and you made the diameter big, and then you made the polymer shell around it small, when the metal breaks, the polymer is not gonna be strong enough to hold the thing together. Mm -hmm. Likewise, if you make the, the metal really, really small and the polymer really big, I mean, you might see some mechanical effects, but it's mostly gonna behave like, um, like a polymer. Um, and so what you need is some balance between the two and the balance you can control by the mechanical properties and the geometry. Now, in our case, what, what, we, what we had was a core, um, just you know, like a wire like this, and it was surrounded by a polymer shell. And one of the things is when that, that core breaks, that polymer shell has gotta be strong enough to cause a subsequent break in the, in the metal. And we have a few things working for us here. One is that gallium is quite soft relative to most metals, uh, I think, probably about an order magnitude softer, if I remember correctly. And so that was a, that was a key thing, um, is that we were actually able to break the metal without breaking the polymer. Um, and so you can look at the stress at failure of the two different materials. So stress at failure is force per area. And then you can multiply it by the area, the cross-sectional area, and figure out so that the two forces are about the same. Um, you need it so that the metal will break at a lower force than the polymer, which is, if I were to be a little bit more concise, that's the essence of the answer, is you need the metal to break before the polymer. Yes. And we're able to do it because of the geometry and because the, the gallium is fairly soft. And I mean, we didn't know any of that when we started, but it, it makes sense. Yeah, thanks. Hey, I, I think we have, uh, okay, 
we've been running questions and answers for about the one and a half hours. Uh, right. So thank you, thank you, Michael, so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk and oh, for you. You know, uh, sharing the insights of all these questions. Wonderful questions and uh, beautiful answers. And uh, Han Qing, thank you very much for uh, yeah. moderating. Thank you, thank, thank, you, thank you, Jimmy. Thank you for uh, organizing this uh, great uh, webinar. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have uh, just a short announcement. I think Teng will uh, put up a slide of next week's uh, EML webinar. Well, uh, Teng is doing that. Uh, let's all thank Michael again for great, great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I think this webinar is, uh, is, uh, is great for the community. So next week, the uh, uh, EML webinar will be given by Professor Chiara Dariel from Caltech. Uh, she will talk about mechanics of a robotic matter, very exciting topic. I'll be serving as the discussion leader. And uh, uh, I'll see all of you uh, next uh, week. And uh, this poster actually is posted in iMechanica. You can download and feel free to help us spread the word and send this to uh, people who uh, might be interested in this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you. See you next week. Wonderful. Yeah, week. Thank and you. I'll thank you all. See you in person uh, in the future soon. Yeah. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you, Bye, everybody. guys. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.